I'm Manoj Karmakar. Uh, I'm your host and the convener of the ISSPS webinar series. If this is your first time to, to be joining us today, then I extend a warm welcome to you. If you're joining us for the ninth time, I truly commend you and you truly are an addict of region anesthesia. I'm very excited today because we put up a really interesting program and uh, it's going to be a variety show with a variety of different topics being addressed by uh, none other than some of the champions of region anesthesia from across the globe. But before I begin the show, I'd like to welcome you a warm welcome from uh, Hong Kong. This has been my home for more than 20 years now, and this is where we perform most of our research and work. So if any of you are passing by Hong Kong in the near future, when we open up to the world, uh, do come and see us. Uh, we are coming to you live from our studios at the Prince of Wales Hospital. Uh, uh, this is um, one of the two major tertiary um, hospitals in, uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, and we are affiliated to the Chinese University of Hong Kong, the Faculty of Medicine. This event, the International Symposium of Spine and Paravertebral Sonography for Anesthesia and Pain Medicine, started way back in 2009. So this year it is our 10th event. So it is our 10th anniversary of this event. And also we are part of the celebrations of our Young University, the Chinese University's 40th anniversary. So this is being um, organized as part of the 40th anniversary celebrations of our Young University. This event, uh, the ninth webinar, is being supported by Vigon. As you know, Vigon has been a forefront of equipment, particularly uh, peripheral nerve block related equipment and vascular access equipment. They are a part of our armamentarium particularly when you look at uh, children related equipment, there's no other better company in my view. They also have been um, in the forefront of innovation of many peripheral nerve blocks and central neuraxial related uh, equipment. If any of you are interested in the equipment, do get in touch with your nearest uh, representative and I'm sure they'll be more than happy to, to give you more details. Uh, I'm proud to say we have about 3,200 participants from all over the world. Uh, we are going live to more than 95 countries, uh, and this is a great achievement. And I and I and I thank you for your trust that you have placed in us, uh, and hope you have taken away as much as we have been uh, able to deliver it to you uh, during this uh, webinar. As I mentioned. Today is a variety show with, uh, with different uh, topics. And after all, variety is the spice of life. So I'm joined by five other champions of region anesthesia from across the globe. The first of them would be Dr. Justin Sangwook Ko. He's from the Sung Kyun Kwan University School of Medicine in Korea. He also works at the Samsung Medical Center, Seoul in the city of Seoul, is an associate professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine at the University School of Medicine. His area of interest um, covers the field of liver transplant surgery, where he has been an innovator for many years, and now it is also in the field of region anesthesia. Today, he will be sharing some of his wisdom in the field of region anesthesia with, with us. Uh, professor Go has been very active in the field of teaching uh, and training in uh, in uh, in Korea and around our region, particularly with RA Asia and the Korean Society of uh, Anesthesiologists, is the director of planning of the Korean Society of Region Anesthesia, and the director of scientific affairs for the Korean Society of Anesthesiologists. Needless to say, <laughs> Professor Ko has published extensively, and today he will be sharing with us some of his original research in the field of. Uh, brachial plexus and his effects on hemidiaphragmatic palsy. He's been an invited speaker at numerous international meetings, and you can see he's a familiar face at many international meetings around the world. Next is Dr. Sinichi Sakura. Professor Sakura is from the Shimani University School of Medicine, 
in Izumo City, Shimane in Japan. He's also the director of Surgical Center of the Shimane University Hospitals. And as many of you know, he is a champion of regional anesthesia from our region. And he has been an innovator of many <laughs> regional anesthetic techniques, particularly paravertebral block with Dr. Sato, where it originated from the Shimane University Hospital many years ago. <clears throat> His area of research includes central neuraxial blocks, peripheral nerve blocks, particularly balanced anesthesia, and neurotoxicity of local anesthetic where he did his early PhD studies. Professor Sakura has extensively uh, published. He's been an invited speaker at numerous international meeting and a guest editor for many of our peer-reviewed journal in anesthesiology. Today, Professor Sakura will be sharing with us his insights about innovation of the knee and the best practices for perioperative analgesia uh, with uh, total knee arthroplasty. The next champion comes all the way from Belgium, Dr. Chris Vermeulen. He's a staff anesthesiologist at the AZ Turnhout uh, in Belgium. Apart from his accomplishment in regional anesthesia, he's also an ardent cyclist, he loves fast, fast cars, and uh, very familiar with the adv outdoor adventure. He's a board member of the Belgian Association of Regional Anesthesia, BARA as they call it. He's also a past board member of ISRA, the European Society of Regional Anesthesia, where he's a very active teacher uh, in many of the regional anesthesia courses, uh, as well as in, in, in Belgium with the uh, Belgian Association of Pediatric Anesthesiologists. By the way, he's also a pediatric anesthetist. Other than his accomplishments in regional anesthesia and anesthesiology in per se, he has been uh, very active in the trauma helicopter, as a trauma helicopter physician when he was at the Erasmus Medical Center at Rotterdam. He recently completed his PhD thesis on the very topic that he will be discussing with us today. He will be sharing his insights with the relation to the fascia ilia compartment block particularly the supraanguinal approach and its applications for perioperative analgesia relating to hip surgery. Okay. The next speaker doesn't read much introduction. is Professor Philip Peng. He's joining us for the second time today. Thank you, Philip, once again for joining us. I know it is very early in the morning in, in Canada at this very moment. Professor uh, Philip Bang is from the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine at the University of Toronto in Canada. He is extensively published and one of the most published in pain medicine, I reckon. And he has been an invited speaker at numerous international meetings. He can best be summed up as being a leader, a researcher, an educator, a pioneer, and an innovator in, in ultrasound for pain medicine. He has received numerous distinguished awards uh, as an educator. Most notable among them are the J.J. Bonica Award uh, and the Isra Award. Finally, we have a uh, Dr. Tony Ng. Tony Ng is a consultant anesthesiology and pain specialist in the Department of Anesthesia and Operating Theaters at the Chun Moon Hospital in Hong Kong. It's not far from where we are coming to you live from. Is also an associate professor at the Department of Anesthesiology, Pain Medicine in the Hong Kong University. Don't be fooled by his young and handsome looks because he has a very, uh, very wise mind on top of his shoulders. And he will be sharing some of his recent insights and some of his recent work about hip denervation, denervation in, for pain management in patients with inoperable hip fracture. This is a group of patients that really increasing uh, in numbers across the world, and they are surely becoming a, a, a major part of, of clinical care. And to be able to provide them pain relief, although they are not suitable for surgery, is truly a great contribution to, not only to science and medicine, but also, I believe, to humanity. A few housekeeping matters. Um, this is a webinar. So as participants, you will have limited access or, or privileges. Uh, you can still ask questions. Please use the chat function to ask questions. One of our moderators, Dr. Christine Lowe, she will um, filter out some of the questions that you have asked, uh, and uh, we will um, 
have it have the uh, discussion during the Q and A session. Uh, since this is a, a a webinar of two halves, we will have three presentations followed by a Q and A, and then a short break, and then we will come back to discuss the remaining three topics. Uh, followed, uh, sorry, uh, three topics followed by a Q and A. So uh, do uh, do uh, do ask the questions that you have uh, during uh, this uh, session. Uh, I'd like to also announce that uh, next Saturday will be our last webinar, and uh, that is the 4th of December. It's also a Saturday. Uh, this will include live demonstration, and we will be joined by uh, two um, champions of uh, point of care ultrasound from Kuala Lumpur and another two champions from Stanford in the United States. Um, our, our contributors from uh, Malaysia, Dr. Sharidan and Dr. Adi Osman, will also be doing a live demonstration on most of the um, focus related or point of care related ultrasound in anesthesia. So I welcome you to um, mark this in your diary and do join us then. These are some of the books that uh, have come out from our stables. So if you're interested, do get in touch with our, uh, with our secretary and um, he or she will be more than happy to, um, to get them to you in the best possible way. So now, without further ado, I'd like to now welcome uh, Professor Ko to deliver us his talk on ultrasound assessment of the hemidrive hematic function and phrenic nerve sparing um, blocks for upper extremity surgery. Justin, the stage is yours. Hello, I'm Justin Ko from Samsung Medical Center in Seoul, Korea. It is my great honor to participate in this very special meeting. Today, I will be speaking about the ultrasound assessment of hemidiaphragmatic function and phrenic nerve sparing blocks for upper extremity surgery. I have nothing to disclose. This is Samsung Medical Center located in Gangnam, Seoul, Korea. It is a 2000 bed hospital with 56 operating theaters and we perform around 200 surgeries every day. And I work here as a liver transplant anesthesiologist, also the regional anesthesiologist. The interscaling block is a valuable energetic option in shoulder surgery. However, phrenic nerve palsy and hemidiaphragmatic paresis are very common after interscaling block. This has significant clinical implication in patients at high risk of respiratory complications. As you know, the innervations of the human shoulder joint are provided by suprascapular nerve and axillary nerve. Both are the branches of the C5 and C6. Therefore, interscaling block, which targets the C5 and C6 root, are most commonly used to provide analgesia after shoulder surgery. However, conventional ultrasound guided interscaling block is associated with high risk of phrenic nerve palsy. This particular study showed 100% incidence of hemidiaphragmatic paresis associated with interscaling brachial plexus anesthesia. The large volumes of local anesthetics ranging from 34 to 52 milliliters of 1.5% Mepivacaine was injected, and all the patients had hemidiaphragmatic paresis and showed a paradoxical upward movement of the ipsilateral diaphragm during inspiration. In the chest x ray, you can clearly see the elevated diaphragm on the affected side. The anatomy of the phrenic nerve is key to understanding the basis for the strategies to reduce the risk of phrenic nerve palsy. The phrenic nerve originates primarily from the fourth cervical ventral ramus, but also receives contributions from both third and fifth ventral rami. The phrenic nerve descends from the root of the neck through the thorax 
and terminate at the ipsilateral diaphragm. This is an ultrasound study of the phrenic nerve in the posterior cervical triangle and discuss the implications for the interscaling brachial plexus block. In figure one at the cricoid cartilage level, the phrenic nerve is adjacent to the brachial plexus. And in figure two, at one centimeter caudal to the cricoid cartilage, the phrenic nerve is identified medial to the brachial plexus, superficial to the anterior scalene muscle. This study illustrated that the phrenic nerve lies within two millimeter of the brachial plexus at the level of cricoid cartilage, but it moves away from the brachial plexus by an additional three millimeter for every one centimeter that it descends into the root of the neck. This excellent review article focuses on the phrenic nerve palsy and regional anesthesia for shoulder surgery. And this picture illustrates the course of the phrenic nerve in the neck. As indicated, it lies within two millimeter to the C5 root at the cricoid cartilage level. Then it travels inferomedially away from the brachial plexus an additional three millimeter separation for every centimeter separation more distal in the neck. This can be demonstrated clearly by ultrasound tracing where you can see the phrenic nerve near the C5 root is moving away from the brachial plexus as it descends into the root of the neck. The phrenic nerve is not always visible in every patient, but in the skinny patient, you can see the phrenic nerve superficial to the anterior scalene muscle. The, in this video, you can see the phrenic nerve here is moving medially as the probe is scanned in caudal direction. And there are several ways to assess the severity of the phrenic nerve palsy, including pulse oximetry and pulmonary function testing using spirometry and diaphragmatic ultrasound. And among these methods, the diaphragmatic ultrasound is reported to show 93% sensitivity and 100% specificity in diagnosing phrenic nerve dysfunction. On patient's right side, the curved transducer is used to visualize diaphragm in the mid-clavicular and right subcostal margin using the liver as the acoustic window. And on the left side, the linear array transducer is used in the left mid-axillary line at the level of ribs eight and nine. Once a hyperechoic diaphragmatic line here is obtained, M-mode sonography is used to quantify the extent of diaphragmatic excursion. Here you can see the movement of the diaphragm during the sniff test where the patient is asked to inspire rapidly and through the nose, but, but after the interscaling block, the diaphra diaphragmatic movement is absent during the sniff test indicating complete hemidiaphragmatic paresis. In this video, you can see the movement of the diaphragm during the inspiration and expiration. You can see this is a diaphragm and you can see it moves as the patient inspires and expires. This is M mode of diaphragmatic movement you can clearly see the normal movement of diaphragm in the pre-block assessment. But at 30 minutes after interscaling block, there is no movement suggesting for the complete phrenic nerve palsy and associated hemidiaphragmatic uh, paresis. 
In some patients, partial hemidiaphragmatic paralysis can occur, and diaph diaphragm excursions are measured before and after the interscaling block. And the percent decrease in diaphragmatic excursion is calculated. In this patient, there is 42.5% reduction at 30 minutes after the block, suggesting for the partial block. In general, complete hemidiaphragmatic paralysis usually defined as 75 to 100% decrease or the occurrence of the par paradoxical movement. And partial paralysis is defined as 25 to 75% decrease in diaphragmatic excursion compared with the pre-block assessment. Then what are the strategies for reducing phrenic nerve palsy? Several modifications to the interscaling block as well as alternative techniques have been tried and tested. These strategies include decreasing local anesthetic dose and volume and performing the block at the location away from the phrenic nerve such as superior trunk block and selectively blocking suprascapular and axillary nerves. First, let's take a look at decreasing local anesthetic volume. The direct visualization of local anesthetic deposition by ultrasound has enabled regional anesthesiologists to decrease the local anesthetic volume while ensuring the block success rate. In this study, the incidence of diaphragmatic paralysis was 45% after injection of 5 milliliter of 0.5% ropivacaine versus 100% with 20 milliliters of local anesthetic injection. And notably, there were similar pain scores, sleep quality, and total morphine consumption up to 24 hours after surgery between the two groups. However, in clinical practice, such low volume may not consistently pro produce sufficient analgesia where regional blocks are often performed by residents and trainees. Next method is to perform a block away from the phrenic nerve, such as superior trunk block. Superior trunk block is an example of refinement of existing block and is intended as an alternative to conventional interscaling block. And superior trunk block was introduced by Dr. Chin and colleagues as in this case report. The C5 and C6 roots unite to form superior trunk and all the terminal branches are supplying the shoulder arise distal to the origin of the superior trunk and hence energetic efficacy is not compromised. The probe image is where conventional block is performed and dotted rectangle indicates the location of the superior trunk block. Also, the phrenic nerve as indicated by the black arrows is descending in a medial direction over the anterior scalene muscle away from the brachial plexus. And at superior trunk level, the phrenic nerve has diverged a considerable distance away from the brachial plexus. These figures show sequential series of images of the brachial plexus. Figure A shows C5 and C6, and, fig and figure B, the phrenic nerve is visible, pointed by white arrow on top of anterior scalene muscle. And in figure C, C7 is visible, and figure D, C5 and C6 roots have coalesced into superior trunk. In this figure, superior trunk lies just under the deep cervical fascia marked by a dotted line and suprascapular nerve is visible as it is about to separate from the superior trunk. You can also see the middle and inferior trunks deep to the su superior trunk. Here you can see the suprascapular nerve branching out and continuing to move laterally as the plexus is scanned more distally. 
Therefore, it is very important to perform the block before suprascapular nerve branches out in order to achieve complete block of the shoulder. Now, let's take a look at the efficacy and safety of the superior trunk block. In 2019, two manuscripts on the superior trunk block were published in anesthesiology. First, Dr. Kim and colleagues assessed whether superior trunk block would provide non-inferior post-operative analgesia compared with the interscaling block and reduce hemidiaphragmatic paresis in patients undergoing arthroscopic shoulder surgery. And, uh, and they showed that when interscaling block was compared with the superior trunk block, less frequent hemidiaphragmatic paresis was seen in the superior trunk block group. And further, it was non-inferior to interscaling block in terms of worst pain scores in the recovery room. The figure A shows superior trunk, middle trunk, and inferior trunks in the blue circles. And figure B and C show that the suprascapular nerve in yellow circle is branching off the superior trunk. The figure D shows that block needle is placed posteriorly to the superior trunk as the local anesthetic is spread as seen in yellow highlight. And figure E shows that the block needed is repositioned anteriorly and laterally to the superior trunk and the local anesthetic is injected at this point. And they showed that the superior trunk group had a significantly lower incidence of hemidiaphragmatic paralysis compared with the interscaling group with the incidence of 4.8% versus 71.4% respectively. And the worst pain scores were similar between the two groups. And they concluded that compared with the interscaling block, the superior trunk block provides non-inferior surgical anesthesia while preserving diaphragmatic function and thus Superior trunk block may therefore be considered as an alternative to a traditional interscaling block for shoulder surgery. This study was performed in our institution, and I would like to introduce Dr. Kang and Dr. Chung, the member of our regional anesthesia team. And in this study, we assessed whether the superior trunk block would provide non-inferior post-operative analgesia compared with the interscaling block and reduce hemidiaphragmatic paralysis. In this figure, the needle is advanced in plane in the lateral to medial direction until the needle tip is positioned adjacent to the lateral border of the superior trunk. And the injection of local anesthetic at this point, hydrodissect the tissue plane around the superior trunk and 20 milliliters of local anesthetic is spread around the superior trunk with minimal need for needle repositioning. And you can see the spread of local anesthetics around the superior trunk. And in this study, we showed that the pain scores at 24 hours postoperatively was similar between the two groups and the energy requirements and all other pain measurements were similar between the two groups. And importantly, hemidiaphragmatic paralysis was observed in 97.5% of the interscaling block group versus 76.3% in the superior trunk block group. However, more importantly, the paralysis was complete in 72.5% in the interscaling block group versus only 5.3% in the superior trunk block group. And this has a significant clinical implication because diaphragmatic function will still be preserved in some degrees after superior trunk block anesthesia. And next, the risk 
of frenic nerve palsy might be eliminated by selectively blocking suprascapular and axillary nerves. The suprascapular nerve provides sensory fibers to approximately 70% of the shoulder joint capsule, and it can either be blocked in the superior, in the suprascapular fossa, or in the root of the neck distal to where it arises from the superior trunk and brachial plexus. And next, the axillary nerve is terminal branch of the posterior, posterior cord of the brachial plexus, and it can be blocked in the anterior chest or as seen in this figure, posterior to the humerus as it emerges from the quadrangular space. In arthroscopic shoulder surgery, suprascapular and axillary nerve block is less effective as shown by higher immediate post-operative pain scores compared with interscalene block. Nevertheless, this technique has not been associated with any reported episodes of phrenic nerve palsy and probably best reserved for patients with pre-existing respiratory dysfunction. And lastly, the hemidiaphragmatic paracyst is also common after supraclavicular brachial plexus block. And this study performed in our institution, we compared the incidence of hemidiaphragmatic paracyst in patients who had a local anesthetic injection, primarily in the corner pocket, defined as the intersection of the first rib and the subclavian artery, with that of patients who underwent injection primarily inside the neural cluster. In corner pocket group, 20 milliliters of local anesthetic was injected in the corner pocket, and then five milliliter of local anesthetic was injected inside the neural cluster. And in the neural cluster group, local anesthetic was deposited primarily inside the neural cluster and secondarily in the corner pocket. And in this study, we showed that the incidence of hemidiaphragmatic paresis was significantly lower in the corner pocket group versus neural cluster group with the incidences of 27.8% versus 66.7%. And thus, we concluded that the incidence of hemidiaphragmatic paresis was effectively reduced when local anesthetic was injected primarily in the corner pocket during right-sided supraclavicular brachial plexus block. And in summary, the incidence of phrenic nerve palsy is very high after conventional interscaling brachial plexus block and it can lead to significant complication in high-risk patients. And then how can we decrease the incidence of phrenic nerve palsy? Those strategies include decreasing local anesthetic dose and volume and performing the block at the location away from the phrenic nerve, such as superior trunk block, and selectively blocking suprascapular and axillary nerves or using corner pocket injection technique for suprascapular, supraclavicular block. And thank you for your attention. And I would like to take this opportunity to promote AACA 2022 in conjunction with Korean Anesthesia 2022, which will be held between November 10 and 13 at COEX Seoul, Korea. Okay, so... Now I'm going to switch a gear and uh, we're going to be talking about regional anesthesia for primary breast cancer surgery, the use of thoracic paravertebral block. Can you do it? Is it really possible? And if it is possible, how is it possible? And if it is not possible, why is it not possible? So there must be more to it than what has been described in the literature. Uh, I have no conflict of interest whatsoever relating to this presentation. So whatever you will hear is from, based on my most of my research. So therefore, some unpublished data will be presented uh, in, in the interest of clarity. 
We will have a few polling uh, questions during this presentation. So I urge you to please poll yes or no to some of these questions. So the first question to you, ladies and gentlemen, is have you ever used thoracic paravertebral block as the sole anesthetic technique for primary breast cancer surgery? So let me pull out the poll for you. So please click here, yes or no. You have 30 seconds, starting now. Don't hesitate, please. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll and uh, share the results to you. So the so the registrants have polled saying that 80% of you have never used paravertebral block for major primary breast cancer surgery. That's a good start because then we can introduce you to the ways that you can really do it in your clinical practice. Of course, it will need some, uh, some practice and know-how. And this is where we are going to deliver it to you. So my objective is to um, describe why paravertebral block may be useful for surgical anesthesia for primary breast cancer surgery. I think needless to say that there are often patients who are not suitable for general anesthesia, but there may be some other indications where um, there is no... Um, randomized studies uh, at this very moment. But I think uh, when we look at other evidence from paravertebral block, this may also be translated to multi-level paravertebral blocks. Uh, I will then innovate, uh, sorry, review the innovation of the breast. We will recap some of the basics of paravertebral block that we've already covered in our previous webinars. And in the interest of those of you who may not have been there, I will introduce you to some of the key concepts. Then we'll see what works and what does not, and if it does not, why it does not work. I will then introduce you to a new concept of pectoral plexus block. Now, primary breast cancer surgery is very frequently performed all around the world. In fact, it may be considered one of the most commonly performed procedures in many centers around the world, particularly in females. It is traditionally performed under general anesthesia. It, produ it produces moderate to severe post-operative pain. Often the pain is unlike when you experience or patients experience with thoracotomy or say major abdominal surgery. Neuropathic pain is a major component of this pain that occurs after breast surgery. And this is even manifested as early as in the post-operative ward. This surgery is associated with a high incidence of post-op nausea and vomiting. But I have to say that as our techniques of anesthesia have changed, I think these incidences are a little bit overestimated. But these are data from an era of, of the use of volatiles primarily. And even with the use of antiemetics, they still suffer from PONB. Thoracic paravertebral block has been advocated as an alternative technique to general anesthesia since the late 1990s, when Dr. Greengrass and the group from um, the Mayo Clinic in the United States published their work on paravertebral block in conjunction with sedation. And in fact, it became so popular that patients indeed um, demanded they have paravertebral blocks. And I believe they were also in, in the Times Magazine because of this popularity and the, and the buzz that it had surrounding the use of this technique in patients undergoing major breast cancer surgery. There's also growing evidence today that it may have a role in reducing chronic pain. And we have also demonstrated that it could improve quality of life after these patients return to the community. So in order to really understand how you could use paravertebral block for surgical anesthesia uh, for primary breast cancer surgery, one has to understand a few, 
few key concepts. One is what kind of tissue destruction actually occurs during this surgery? Now, there's a host of different techniques that are described, but when you look at primary breast cancer surgery, it may primarily be described as a surgery that involves um, removing the breast lump, which is um, modified radical mastectomy. They remove the, the parenchyma of the breast with the fascia overlying the pectoralis minor muscle, major muscle. And then they do a central lymph node biopsy. And depending on the results of the biopsy of the lymph node, they do an axillary dissection. So you could have a simple mastectomy with just a simple central and lymph node biopsy and a combination of different kind of, uh, of uh, breast conservative surgery, which only involves the parenchyma and neither the fascia of the pectoral muscle or the pectoral muscles at all. Radical mastectomy is actually a, a, a thing of the past when it was a very destructive operation, not only removal of the breast, but including the, uh, the muscles and the entire axillary lymph node chain surrounding relating to it. Next concept we need to understand is what is the innovation of the breast? Actually, the innovation of the breast is very complex. I've in, indeed been chasing the dream of performing primary breast cancer surgery with paravertebral blocks for more than close to two decades now, and I still don't know the answer. But I have developed a lot of wisdom along the way, which I will share with you today. I would really highly recommend this um, review article by Dr. Glenn Woodworth and colleagues uh, who describe in this uh, qualitative review of the anatomy uh, and innovation of the breast. And I think this is the most complete de description in our literature. So when you look at the innovation of the breast, we need to consider not only the skin and uh, the cutaneous innovation, but also the parenchyma, the axilla. And in particularly, uh, there's growing evidence that afferent nociception is also contributed from particularly the pectoral muscles and maybe even the serratus anterior and the latissimus dorsi, which are closely related to the breast or to the axillary lymph node dissection. So the intercostal nerves are a major contributor to the cutaneous and, uh, in, and parenchymal innovation of the breast. Innovation comes from the, uh, to the breast gum from T2 to T6, and maybe also T7 in most cases. But note that there is no you know, contribution from T1 on the anterior part of the chest wall. Now, in, there are many uh, textbooks in, in, in region anesthesia of the past who actually describe the T1 anteriorly. But as you can see, this is the more evidence-based dermatomal map that actually has no innovation on the anterior chest wall relating to T1. So it begs the question, do you really need a T1 injection when you perform these, these procedures? Nevertheless, uh, it also receives innovation from uh, the other uh, nerves that are in, in its vicinity. The intercostal nerves provide innovation to the lateral cutaneous branches, particularly the medial branch, which is indeed defined as the, um, as the medial mammary nerves. These, are, these become the, the lateral mammary nerves. And, as the, and a branch from the, uh, the medial branch of the anterior cutaneous branch of the intercostal nerve forms the, the medial mammary nerves. So you have from T2 to T6, you have these uh, medial and lateral memory nerves that uh, innovate the, the skin and the parenchyma of the breast. You can see here in this cartoons that they are represented here, T2 to T6. And also in this picture from Dr. Woodwards, you can see how the anterior branches of the lateral cutaneous nerves, these are indeed the lateral memory nerves and the medial branches of the anterior cutaneous nerve from the medial memory branches, the T2 to T6, supply most of this innovation. There's over an overlap, sometimes also from the contralateral side. The supraclavicular nerves, from, particularly from the uh, superficial cervical plexus, so take from a C4 to C5, through the three nerves, the medial, intermediate, and lateral, provide innovation to the upper part of the, um, the flap of the breast, particularly when they are dissecting the upper flap of the breast to gain access to the parenchyma and the, uh, the base of the breast over the pectoral muscles. The pectoral nerves uh, are gaining in um, popularity amongst our speciality 
the often described as the lateral and medial pectoral nerves. Uh, as you will see that, if you review the literature in depth, you'll find that the concept of the pectoral nerve as being two nerves is rather simplistic. And it's naive to think that two injections to the lateral and medial pectoral nerves will produce blockade of this of these of the pectoral nerves that innervate mostly the muscles uh, of the uh, of the of the chest wall, particularly the pec major and minor. These are some of the references that I will be referring to during this presentation. The lateral pectoral nerve emerges from the lateral cord. The medial pectoral nerve emerges from the medial cord. So it's usually from C5, 6, the lateral pectoral, and the C8, T1 is the medial pectoral nerve. This is right out of uh, Gray's anatomy, if you may, ladies and gentlemen. And this is how it is described. Also is described in many um, textbooks that the pectoral nerves are indeed motor, pure motor nerves. I think they're growing evidence that there are no pure motor nerves in the body. Uh, they have uh, sensory innovation. Uh, they have sensory, sensory fibers within them. They also contain sympathetic fibers. Now let's take a look at this uh, paper from uh, Clinical Anatomy by this group of researchers from um, Birmingham, Alabama. And they said that, quoted that the peripheral nerves, the, the pectoral nerves are mainly considered motor nerves, but they may also contain sensory fibers uh, as they innovate the shoulder, and they also supply innovation to the, um, to the uh, acromioclavicular joints and many other aspects that are related to the shoulder. So they are involved with afferent nociception from the shoulder, and therefore they are also involved with afferent nociception from the breast via the pectoral muscles. Similarly, it has been shown that the spinal accessory nerves also contains sensory fibers that are non-proprioceptive sensory function uh, that serves non-proprioceptive sensory function, including pain. Furthermore, to think about the lateral pectoral nerve as two simple nerves, as I mentioned, is rather naive because you can see there's great variation in the origin of the lateral and the medial pectoral nerves, even from the inferior trunk, uh, sorry, from the inferior trunk or the uh, medial cord and from the upper trunk, which is the lateral cord. There is marked variation as shown in this, uh, in this particular publication. Another publication that I highly recommend to you is this publication, the Journal of Plastic Reconstructive and Aesthetic Surgery by Sylvia and David and their, research, and their research group. What they described is that in their cadaver dissection, they'd performed about 26 dissections in 15 cadavers, and they found that the pectoral nerves were indeed not two nerves. They were three consistent branches of the pectoral nerves and they could define them very consistently in dissection after dissection. You can see here, there is a superior branch, a middle branch, and an inferior branch. All this crisscross along um, the, um, in the infraclavicular area close to the origin of the thoracoacromial artery. Now the thoracoacromial artery will be an important landmark for you ladies and gentlemen. So do remember that you can see here the superior branch, the middle branch and the inferior branch, including the ancestor pectoralis, which is the, the fiber that Chris Carson communicates between these branches are also very closely related to the thoracocromial artery. These nerves are not small nerves. You can see here, they are relatively sized nerves and they are the superior middle and the inferior branches of the pectoral nerves. Also this work by Dr. Lee, from Korea showed that there were marked variation in the spinal region of the lateral and medial pectoral nerves. So the thing that the lateral pectoral nerve <clears throat> receives only in a contribution from C5, 6, uh, or the medial pectoral nerve receives only from the C8 and T1 is, uh, <clears throat> um, is naive in that respect. As you can see here, there's marked variation in the contributions of the different uh, spinal nerves towards the lateral and towards the formation of the medial pectoral nerve. So much so, based on the available literature at the time, Dr. Lee and their group described a subpectoral plexus of nerves. This is a network of nerves that are between and deep to the pectoral muscles. They come from the C5, 6, 7, 8, and T1. This is pretty much like what you see with the brachial plexus. The roots of the brachial plexus are C5, 6, 7, 8, and T1. By C5 and 6 join and form mostly the superior branch, which is, may represent the lateral pectoral nerve. The C7 continues as the middle branch, uh, which may represent 
the ends of pectoralis nerves, which communicates with both, with the older concept, and the CA81 from the from the inferior branch, which would be the medial pectoral nerve from the older concept. So all this is happening uh, deep to and between the pectoral muscles, and in very close uh, relationship to the to the thoracoacromial artery. <clears throat> as you can see in this dissection by Dr. Salablanche from um, Barcelona, as you <laughs> split the pectoral muscles, you can see there's an intricate network of very fine nerves that are not only deep to the pectoral muscle, also in between the pectoral muscles, uh, between the pectoralis major and the minor. And we will come to that uh, in more detail shortly. Other branches that are the long thoracic and thoracodorsal nerves have also been um, implicated as being involved with afferent nociception, but the exact contribution to afferent nociception is still not known. Um, there's very posit there's a positive data on this area, but given that uh, the pectoral muscles, the uh, pectoral nerves that innervate the pectoral muscles contribute to an afferent nociception, and if you look at the serratus anterior supplied by the long thoracic nerve and the latissimus dorsi, particularly when they're doing latissimus dorsi flaps, etc., thoracodorsal nerve block may be desirable. Again, today we are not. Um, very clear about the contribution of the thoracodorsal and, and the long thoracic nerves. So it is usually in my practice, I don't usually block these nerves because very rarely the surgeon um, operates or involves uh, this area of innovation. Also, the, media, uh, the sympathetic fibers via the middle cervical ganglia and the stellate ganglion provide postganglionic sympathetic fibers that are involved with, uh, with afferent nociception. There are also some associated anatomy, and I mentioned some of that to you before, uh, is the thoracoacromial arch is very closely related to the superior middle and the ansa, ansa pectoralis and the inferior branch. And these branches, particularly the middle and the inferior, actually uh, go into the interpectoral plane uh, where the uh, thoracoacromial, uh, uh, the pectoral branch of the thoracoacromial artery is located. Now, some, in some individual, it's very difficult to define the interpectoral plane between the pec major and minor. A surrogate marker for that would be to look for the uh, pectoral branch of the thoracoacromial artery and perform the injection adjacent to it. So the innovation of the breast, ladies and gentlemen, is rather complex. It not only receives innovation from the intercostal nerves by the T2 to T6, but also the infraclavicular area receives innovation from the supraclavicular nerves. The lateral and medial pectoral nerve, although have no cutaneous innervation, but by innervating the uh, the parent chyma and the uh, uh, and the uh, sorry the by innervating the muscles, they uh, uh, contribute to overall afferent nociception. Uh, they are also overlapping uh, innervation across the midline. So, despite your best efforts, sometimes overlapping um, innervation may uh, result in a, in a patients reporting pain. Okay, with this background, if we now look at the dermatomal cover that you really need for a major breast cancer surgery, primary breast cancer surgery like um, modified mastectomy, then you need somewhere from C4 to T6. And really, that's a, that's a many nerves or many paravertebral injections for you, ladies and gentlemen. But then today it is not really known what are the major contributors to this. Certainly the intercostal nerves do contribute um, in a major way to the afferent nociception, uh, but the exact role of the supraclavicular nerves, the, um, the thoracodorsal long thoracic nerve is still not, not known. Now let's take a look at paravertebral blocks and we have uh, discussed at length many uh, aspects of this. I'm going to quickly cover some of this here. So paravertebral injection is a technique inject adjacent to the um, intervertebral foramina. It's a very uh, interesting repository uh, location because it not only contains the somatic nerves, but also the sympathetic nerves. So uh, an injection of local anesthetic into the paravertebral space via spread to the epidural, to the intercostal, via the paravertebral route, and often also from the via the prevertebral route can spread to the contralateral side. They communicate, the paravertebral spaces communicate with each other. So uh, an injection into one space can spread easily to the contiguous sites, producing multidermatomal, segmental, somatic, and sympathetic nerve blockage. So you get uh, ipsilateral 
it is segmental, it is somatic and sympathetic thoracic nerve blockade. And this is a, a good uh, image for you to illustrate uh, what really happens after the injection. You can see there was some air was used as loss of resistance to identify the paravertebral space. You can see here that there is some spread to the retrolamellar space. There is spread to the epidural space, the spread to the paravertebral and the intercostal space. Note that Ipsilateral epidural spread is, is very common after a paravertebral injection. Up to 70 to 80% of them will exhibit um, epidural spread after a single injection. Uh, if you perform multiple injections, the epidural spread is much more evident. Therefore, the ipsilateral somatic and sympathetic nerve blockade can be useful for unilateral type of surgery. Now, in this era when ultrasound guidance has been the, uh, the go-to for paravertebral blocks, there are some minor changes in our uh, in the techniques. So several ultrasound guided techniques have been described today, but no optimal techniques are known. Success of a paravertebral block is ultrasound guidance has been shown to be superior than a landmark based technique. Good work by Dr. Patnaik and their group. Our medial injection techniques produce greater epidural spread. There's a wider segmental uh, spread of anesthesia and analgesic efficacy is also greater with a medial a technique, this work by Dr. Takeda and their group from Japan has shown a paralaminar approach uh, may be desirable. Large volume injections also produce wider segmental anesthesia. Now, whether you use a single or a multiple injection, uh, that's debatable, but generally for anesthesia, if you want consistent, repeatable anesthesia, then multiple injection is the go-to. A single injection can still be uh, limited by its uh, coverage of certain dermatomes, and we will come to that. Rural puncture is rare in experience and trained hands, but can still occur even with ultrasound guidance. So being trained and, uh, and uh, getting, gaining some experience under supervision is always desirable. Some of the new concepts about the anatomy of the paravertebral block, a paravertebral space that Dr. Cho and the group have recently published from um, Korea, is um, is very interesting conceptually um, and requires further clinical evaluation. And I'm sure you will hear more about this in the near future. I mentioned to you in my previous pre last week's presentation that we use the transverse scan at the level of the articular process. It's an in-plane needle insertion techniques. Today, we have performed more than four or five thousands of these injections with almost, uh, we have had no pleural punctures or pneumothoraces so far. We use a curved linear transducer. It's uh, used in a sequential manner, starting from the transverse process and rib, and then it's slowly translated to the inferior articular process level. The inferior articular process is very important because the inferior articular process is related to the intervertebral foramina. As you can see here, this is the rib transverse process. This is the level of the transverse process. And as you are at the level of the inferior articular process, you can see, there is no obstruction in front of you and the wedge-shaped paravertebral space is, is visible. We use a curved linear transducer because it gives you a wide field of view. And as you can see here, you can see the spinous process, the lamina, the posterior directed transverse process and its articulation and the rib. This is the first window. The next window is the transverse process window where you now don't have the rib. You can see the lung sliding sign with the plural here and the thick ligament. Uh, uh, behind it, with the apical part of the paravertebral space is also visible. And you can indeed place a needle here, as Dr. Shibata and the group from Japan have demonstrated many, many years ago. Uh, further, if you go more caudally, uh, your transverse process shadow is no more visible. You now see the inferior articular process as this osseous structure with the shadow and this triangular space uh, to your, or to the right of the article, indeed the wedge-shaped paravertebral space and this is the, our target uh, ultrasound window for ultrasound guided paravertebral injections. Uh, this is just a quick recap of the three ultrasound windows aiming for the inferior articular process. And the osseous window changes until you can see only the inferior articular process at the target ultrasound window with the triangular wedge shaped space. Also do remember that the intervertebral foramen is very closely related to the articular process. So going too close to the foramen would also not be desirable. So while injecting it medially is, is desirable, 
but going too medial is not desirable. So how you can work out a balance is, is sometimes a difficult situation. Okay, the in-plane needle insertion occurs, and this is the typical ergonomics of how we perform. You use an assistant to help you to perform the injections. Uh, this is the target ultrasound window. And uh, this is obviously a better view in, 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 in most patients. You don't see this, but is, this is a presentation. I'm going to show you a better view, okay? The needle is inserted in plane from a lateral to medial direction. We use echogenic needles. You can see here, visibility is very good. Uh, the ergonomics are, are good. Uh, and the needle is inserted from a lateral to medial direction. Originally, we were aiming for the apex, but now we aim for somewhere between the apex and the medial part of the paravertebral space. Uh, aiming to inject as medially as possible. Once you perform the injection, you will see anterior displacement of the pleura, widening of the paravertebral space. As you will see here, the needle is being introduced in plane from a lateral to medial direction, aiming to place it at the paravertebral space, after which you insert, you inject saline. Saline should always be the, um, the first injection before you inject the local anesthetic. Uh, if you can see the spread of the saline in the paravertebral space, that also excludes to a certain extent intravascular injection. And then when you see the, um, uh, the, the displacement of the pleura and the widening of the paravertebral space, that heralds injection of the local anesthesia, then it injects the correct paravertebral injection. So how do we conduct anesthesia? Now, in, initially we performed uh, six injections because this is what was suggested in the literature from T1 to T6 as a multi, multiple injections and uh, with, with in conjunction with sedations. So the anesthesia was conducted. We sedate our patients by giving midazolam one to two milligrams IV. Once they are positioned, they have been put on oxygen and we monitor the CO2 via nasal cannula. And they're given 10 to 20 milligrams of ketamine uh, for comfort during the procedure. We start an infusion of dexmedetomidine, depending on the age and, um, uh, and the body habitus, somewhere between 0.1 and 0.5 mics per kilo per hour. Uh, we don't give a bolus of dexmedetomidine infusion because we find it induces a lot of bradycardia in some of these elderly patients. So midazolam is the, is the um, inducer of sedation, if you may, and then dexmedetomidine catches up in about half an hour's time when patients are indeed maintaining awake sedation or conscious sedation. Uh, this is uh, the ergonomics you can see here. I've shown you these pictures before. Uh, we mark the level under strict aseptic precautions to perform these injections. Of course, it is very important when you perform these injections to try and maximize the chance of success and to use your, uh, your dominant hand as much as possible. And I will just illustrate to you. Ensure that uh, the side up is always the side of the block. So timeout procedure should be an uh, integral part of it. I performed the wrong sided paravertebral block in my life once, and I hope I don't do it again, which I hope I will not. So you can perform six injections, but today it is our practice to perform three alternate injections. And I will come to that, how this has come to be. We perform between T2 and T3, T4 and uh, T5, and then T6 and T7. So these are three injections that we perform. Now, uh, when you perform these blocks, it's, it's paramount that you position your patient in such a way that you are able to use your dominant hand for the needle uh, needling. Otherwise, uh, you may find yourself in a position where you have your non-dominant hand when you you'll obviously uh, chances of success are very low. Strict aseptic precaution under local infiltration. The needle is inserted from a lateral to medial direction. Uh, we use echogenic needles today because the angle of insertion can sometimes be steep and visualizing the needle is not as simple as doing many peripheral nerve blocks. And since uh, the, uh, the risk of uh, inadvertently punctured pura is very high, we, um, we use echogenic needles for all paravertebral injections. Um, we use an assistant to help us uh, inject the saline first. And once you confirm the needles in the correct place, you then can change it to the local anesthetic. We deposit somewhere between six to eight mils of local anesthetic at alternate levels today. As we said, T2, T4, and T6. Uh, we inject 0.5 ropivacaine or levivacaine, uh, but we add epinephrine because 
it reduces systemic absorption and reduces the potential for systemic toxicity. As I mentioned, if you are trained and you have uh, the experience, as we show in this uh, retrospective follow-up that rural puncture incidence is zero. This is a follow-up of more than 500 patients with more than 1,500 individual paraverbal injections in a breast unit only, where pleural puncture was actually zero. There were no incidents of clinical pneumothoracis. Sedation is maintained intraoperatively using dexmedetomidine. Patients listen to music, and they are still in verbal contact with you if you ask them. Uh, and this is the, the layout of how we uh, do it. You can see here the pectoral is, <laughs> the breast is removed from the, uh, with the fascia from the pectoral major muscle using diathermy. So often you will see a lot of muscle contraction. So how to use it for paravertebral blockade is the next. You can, as I showed you, you can do multiple injections, but I think there is a role for single injections too. And um, single injection can be quite a useful tool and a powerful tool for major breast cancer, particularly primary breast cancer surgery. Multilevels are mostly used for uh, surgical anesthesia. Now, do you perform C7 to T6, T1 to T6, or just perform uh, a three injection? These are all, again, uh, up for studies, uh, but our clinical experience is three are usually adequate today in the day of ultrasound guidance. Folks have also described continuous catheter techniques for breast surgery, but we have abandoned the use of catheters in patients undergoing breast surgery uh, many years ago, and I will mention that mention why to you in a, in a short while. So a single injection is performed at uh, T3, T4, 25 to 30 cc's of local anesthetic sign is injected. Now, my next question to you is, based on your understanding of the innovation of the breast and uh, the uh, dynamics that uh, a uh, paravertebral block can achieve. Okay, do you think uh, a single injection will be adequate for surgical anesthesia? Please poll now. Okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so very rightly, 85% majority, if you say that it is not going to be effective, very correct. I think uh, a single injection, you may be lucky on a Monday, but don't expect to be lucky every day of the week because although single injection ultrasound guided blocks can produce quite extensive sensory motile blockade, but to provide anesthesia that is needed for surgical anesthesia, you may have to do just more than uh, uh, a single injection. So uh, the norm is to perform multi-level injections. Okay, um, this is a study by Dr. Upal uh, and the group. I think they were at, in London with Dr. Ganapathy at the time. They performed a uh, single injection and three injections, uh, paravertebral blocks uh, by injecting 20 to 25 cc's of local anesthetic. You can see here, they demonstrated there were no significant difference in dermatomal spread, but you can see here, the, um, the number of patients who have T1 or T7 blockade are not all 100% of them. So you can see that it's not 100% in most cases. When you want it for surgical anesthesia, then you need 100% uh, sensory blockade. So I think this uh, is very interesting data, but it needs validation for surgery. In, uh, but nevertheless, a single injection can be very useful. It can help you to reduce um, opioid requirements improve recovery. Uh, it also been shown to reduce the incidence of chronic pain six months, 12 months after surgery. We've also shown that it actually reduces severity of chronic pain symptoms and improves the quality of both physical and mental health three and six months after surgery. We also found that whether you perform a single injection or, 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 a, or a continuous infusion, uh, there are no differences in early or late outcomes. So since the uh, pain relieving uh, properties and its uh, chronic pain attenuating uh, effects of a single injection compared to a continuous infusion in relation to uh, modified radical mastectomy are very similar, we have abandoned the use of continuous uh, catheters for primary breast cancer surgery. We use multimodal analgesia in conjunction with uh, paravertebral blocks. So multi-level injections of the T1 to T6 are frequently used. And my question to you now is, 
Do you think a multi-level ultrasound guided paravertebral block will be effective as the sole anesthetic for primary breast cancer surgery uh, in conjunction with sedation? Please call now. So some of you are still undecided because we haven't reached. Uh, okay, good. So I'm going to end the poll now. So majority of you say that a single multi-level paravertebral in conjunction with sedation is going to be adequate for surgical anesthesia. But a few, 25% of you more experienced and well-known individuals have very correctly said it would not be effective. Okay, so uh, let me show you some, some data relating to that and uh, how it may uh, relate to major breast, primary breast cancer surgery. Now, in the days of its uh, helm, uh, multi-level paravertebral block in conjunction with sedation was used for surgical anesthesia, providing very effective anesthesia report in literature with minimal complication, high degree of patient satisfaction, including surgical satisfaction within the opera. As I said, it became very famous, including went to the, I wouldn't say a cover of the Times Magazine, but it was, it was really very popular at the time. Randomized studies also showed that a multi-level paravertebral block for surgical and reduces post-operative pain compared to those who receive only general anesthesia. It produces very long pain relief, prolonged pain relief, sometimes even, even out, um, you know, uh, it's a, it uh, the ex the duration of block often outlasted the what expected duration of the block, and they also read very few anesthetic uh, or uh, analgesic requirements. To so much so, all this holistically improved post-op quality of recovery, and also there's some data to suggest that uh, there was shorter hospital stay. As I mentioned to you, I've been chasing this dream for about twenty-two decades now. But my experience have always been different. In the beginning, I thought maybe the uh, landmark-based techniques, some of them were not taken up well, so the patient reported pain. But now that we were started to use multi-level ultrasound-guided injections, where you could very objectively confirm the correctness of the injection, but we still found that majority of patients still reported pain while our patients were on dexmedetomidine uh, sedation. So it was very puzzling. In fact, this paper went from pillar to post to try and get this published, but eventually we published it. And this is uh, outlines our experience and that we presented uh, at the Journal of Pain Research in 2020. We showed that despite a multi-level paravertebral block, 80% of patients will report pain. And these patients require ketamine substitution Although the doses of ketamine are relatively low, but they usually require ketamine substitution. They require ketamine substitution, particularly during certain surgical interventions. One is when your surgeon is removing the, the fatty parenchyma of the breast from the pectoral muscles. While the muscles contract, the patients very synchronously will report a dull aching pain, uh, often it often thought as a as a as a failure of the paravertebral block, but do remember that it is this is not innervated by the paravertebral uh, nerves or the intercostal nerves, and the paravertebral block will not anesthetize these muscles. And it also proves that uh, there are afferent nociceptive signals that are being transmitted from the pectoral muscles during this uh, particular intervention. Uh, more recently, Dr. Patnaik and the group have also compared landmark and, uh, and ultrasound guidance. And in fact, uh, I'm pleased to report here, their experience also is similar. If you see ultrasound guidance, 94% were actually successful in terms of producing the block. Uh, they also produced, uh, the ultrasound guidance also produced uh, better sensory blockade. They also produced um, greater uh, chances of um, reduced pain in the rest and movement. Uh, uh, this is in movement. The ultrasound was the winner. But look at this. Um, their experience is that 80% of patients, even despite the multi-level ultrasound guided paravertebral block required 
rescue energy requirement uh, in agreement with our data. So remember, ladies and gentlemen, that even if you do a multi-level paravertebral block, patients will still report pain. And I think the answer is quite obvious that there are other afferent nociceptors that are involved. And this is in fact uh, uh, a letter to the editor by Dr. Juan Guay from Canada, questioning the, the validity of a multi-level paravertebral block for, for uh, as efficacy for breast surgery when she actually tabulated the amount of sedation that many of these publications in the previous literature have actually given. Today, they would be considered as general anesthesia in, in most if you critically analyze them. So time for reflection. So the pectoral muscles are innervated by the pectoral nerves. So a paravertebral block will not block this. So um, it is it is um, suggests that these nerves are involved with afferent nociception. So we've been um, practicing a technique of uh, performing uh, pectoral nerve blocks for for a number of years now, and hopefully we have uh, we have mastered it so much so that uh, we we describe this as subpectoral plexus block based on the the subpectoral plexus concept described by Lee and their group. It is also uh, uh, using uh, performed in the supine position using a linear transducer, as you can see here. It's an in-plane needle insertion from a lateral to medial direction. We aim to place the, <coughs> the transducer uh, in this uh, linear fashion here, aiming for the, the uh, visualizing the second part of the axillary artery with the pec major and the minor. Uh, you also look for the thoracoacromial artery, the origin of the thoracoacromial artery. And the previous slide, you saw the, uh, the vessels that are between the pec major and the minor. These are the uh, acromial, uh, sorry, the pectoral branch of the thoracoacromial artery. So the aim is to perform an injection between the two muscles and deep to the pectoral muscle, away from the slightly away from the where the thoracoacromial artery is visualized. It's an in-plane needle insertion. This is another perspective looking from the head end of the patient. You insert the needle uh, initially either to the interpectoral or the um, deep to the pectoral um, minor muscle. You use saline to hydrodissect your way. Uh, it may look dangerous, but you'll be very surprised that it's not so dangerous as it may appear to you. You can see here with saline, and then we inject. We started with five mils of 0.25% <clears throat> ropivacaine because remember, you've already injected quite a bit of local anesthetic for your paravertebral injection. Thereafter, the needle is withdrawn <clears throat> and a second injection is performed um, close to the thoracoacromial artery, or sorry, the uh, pectoral branch of the thoracoacromial artery between the pec major and the minor muscle. You see here, you will soon see separation of the two muscles and five mils of local anesthetic is deposited here. Now, the question to you, ladies and gentlemen is, Will a multi-level paravertebral block, this is a 6M, which is six injections with a subpectoral plexus block, as I described, be effective as the sole anesthetic for primary breast cancer surgery? So this is a question number four for you. Please poll if you would like to say yes or no. Okay, so everybody is uh, getting more in tune with what I'm trying to say. 80% of you say that it, oops, let me share this with you. So 80% of you say that uh, it will be effective for the primary breast cancer surgery, while 20% of you say no. I think uh, the 20% of you are indeed correct. Let me share some uh, some data with you here. So when we looked at our, our study, looking at 6M followed by the 10 ml of uh, this injection using this clinical trial registry, this study is still not yet published. We will in a short, it was presented at the last ASA meeting. And you will see that um, number of uh, patients who required ketamine was significantly greater in the patients who had only the multi-level. So the, uh, the pectoral plexus block the subpectoral plexus is, is indeed providing some uh, efficacy, as you can see here, it almost halves the number, 94% versus 54%, uh, and the dose of ketamine requirement is also much lower in the subpectoral plexus block, but it does not eliminate the need for rescue analgesia. Now, the next question to you is, we've already done six injections, 
and we've done a subpectral plexus block. Do you think, do you consider multiple injection, six injections with a subpectral plexus block as too many injections for a, for a single patient? Please poll yes or no. Okay, thank you. Okay, so majority of you say that they are indeed too many injections, six injections followed by another interpectoral injection. But interestingly, when we uh, question these patients or interrogate these patients post-operatively, uh, given that they have received the sedation, they often have no recollection of the number of injections or what uh, they had had for their, for their surgery. But as a given that, I also felt that there were too many injections. We did a pilot study where we looked at performing alternate injections with a subpectral plexus block as we described. However, you can see here that, um, that in this 30 patients that we did as a pilot under this clinical trial number, we found that even 5%, five of them required um, uh, us to hold a mask uh, with a volatile anesthetic for a short while, while uh, in one of the, in two of them, they were doing us the upper flaps and in two, three of them, they were doing the auxiliary uh, lymph nodes. So uh, the rescue ketamine requirements uh, were, were still required, uh, but you will see here that the rescue ketamine requirements are relatively low. So you can indeed do uh, three injections uh, with a subpectoral plexus block for primary breast cancer surgery. And this is quite consistent with what we are, are doing today. And in this study, we also looked at the power of the PEC major and the PEC minor. And you will see here that often most of them will still have normal motor function uh, when they are assessed in the recovery with a few, with uh, some weakness of the PEC major and the minor, but no paralysis. Also, it is not known today uh, whether uh, you need a complete uh, blockade of the pectoral nerves for analgesia uh, or just a, a paresis like so would be adequate. Our data suggests that you don't need complete paralysis or, or of these um, nerves because it's not possible to assess sensory dermatomal innovation because they have no dermatomal innovation. So the only way to assess the uh, efficacy in the pectoral nerves is to assess their motor function. Surgeons will you would say a 70% satisfaction is, is relatively good. And today they are quite happy. Finally, uh, I think I've exceeded my time uh, by a bit, but today we are actually looking at the efficacy of five plus five versus 10 plus 10 mil injection. And our preliminary experience, uh, pilot experience uh, indicates that uh, our hypothesis is that if you perform three injections in the paravertebral and you combine it with uh, the subpectoral plexus block with 10 and 10 mils of 0.25%, uh, you will have a better success. So try that out if you are um, in, in, in uh, performing this in your clinical practice. So my concluding remarks is that providing surgical anesthesia for primary breast cancer surgery is very complex. It's not as simple or there is more to it than what meets the eye as you, if you read the literature. Nevertheless, 80% of patients still require rescue uh, analgesia. Albeit, they are relatively small doses. And as long as you are aware at what points in the surgery they require pain, if you preempt these, uh, these surgical um, uh, steps, your patient will be uh, quite comfortable. A subpectoral plexus block does complement the anesthesia provided by a, by a multi-level block. However, future research is still warranted, and many of these are, are currently ongoing in our institution. Okay, I hope that gives you a lot of uh, food for thought to think about what paravertebral blocks are and what it can and it cannot do when it comes to breast surgery. So when you read about paravertebral blocks, be critical. Uh, with this background of information, I'm sure that you'll be able to um, interpret the results in a more a logical way. Okay, I now would like to invite Dr. Sakura, I've already introduced to you to uh, Professor Shinichi Sagura from uh, Shimane. Uh, he's now going to share with us his insights on the innovation of the knee joint and back best practices for post-operative analgesia after total knee arthroplasty. Over to you, Sakura-san. Good evening. 
Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shinji Sakura, an anesthesiologist working at Shimane University Hospital in Japan. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Kamaka for the invitation and opportunity to give a lecture in this webinar today. In my talk, I'd like to share with you the latest information on regional anesthesia for total neosoplasty. First, I'd like to focus on the innovation of the knee. Then I'll cover most of the regional techniques available now for total knee arthroplasty, followed by a pain management protocol that best works in my institution now. The pandemic has taken a toll on every aspect of our daily life. However, I hope we have already seen the worst. My town is a popular tourist destination because of Izumo Taisha Shrine, that is one of the most prestigious shrines in Japan. This picture shows what the shrine looked like during the pandemic, I mean, a few months ago. But now we can see tourists coming back. I like to believe we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. I have nothing to disclose in relation to this uh, presentation. Total knee arthroplasty is a measure to relieve pain and regain normal activities. To reach the goal, rehabilitation process plays a crucial role. It can help the patients heal from surgery faster and greatly improve their chances for long-term success. However, several factors can prevent rehabilitation. First, pain. Without adequate pain control, Doing exercise is impossible. Second, nausea and dizziness that often comes with opioid analgesics. An ideal analgetic regimen should reduce opioid consumption. And third, now uh, muscle weakness. You need a certain degree of muscle strength, for example, to stand up and ambulate. In that regard, regional anesthesia can play an important role. To achieve the goals, you need to understand how the knee is innovated. This slide shows a typical dermatome map of the nerves in the lower limb. Nerves from the lumbar plexus, including femoral nerve and lateral femoral extensor nerve, are, are, sorry, are responsible uh, for sensation in the anterior knee. Nerves from the sacral plexus, mostly sciatic nerve, are responsible for dermatomous sensation in a distal part of the anterior knee and the posterior side of the knee. Regarding the knee joint, basically four nerves supply the sensation, femoral nerve, of genital nerve, and the two components of the sciatic nerve, tibial and common perineal nerves. Previous cadaveric studies have further identified the articular branches that are responsible for sensation of the knee joint. This slide shows the list of the nerves innervating the anterior aspect in each quadrant. We now know that the anterior knee joint is innervated by at least 10 nerves, including the nerve to vastus medialis, intermediaris, and lateralis, and saphenous nerve, common perineal and recurrent perineal nerves, and four genital nerves that originate from the nerve to vastus medialis, tibial nerve, and common perineal nerve. Regarding the posterior knee joint capsule, previous cadaveric studies have found that articular branches of tibial nerve and posterior obturator nerve form a fine plexus called popliteal plexus. In addition, a posterior branch of common perineal nerve separately contribute to the sensation. Then you decide which regional anesthesia techniques to use. Here, let me remind you that all the nerve fibers to the knee originate from these two major plexuses, lumbar plexus and sacral plexus. Femoral, obturator, and lateral femoral extensor nerves are branches of the lumbar plexus. Sciatic nerve, is a branch of the sacral plexus. Neuraxial block, I mean epidural block, 
can block both plexuses, but may not help achieve the goal of total knee arthroplasty because it causes muscle weakness in both legs. Instead, peripheral nerve blocks are a better choice if you have enough knowledge of what each block can offer to a patient and have the skill to conduct them. For the next 20 minutes or so, I'll, you'll hear about these blocks one by one. First, femoral nerve block, that has been a kind of gold standard for a long time. Because the landmark is very clear, especially by using ultrasound, it's one of the least technically demanding peripheral nerve blocks. Continuous femoral nerve block works reliably most of the time. Many studies have shown that femoral nerve block can provide similar pain relief to epidural analgesia after total knee arthroplasty. However, blocking femoral nerve results in quadriceps muscle weakness, which may limit physical rehabilitation like gait training and stair climb practice. Nowadays, rehabilitation starts on the first post-operative day in many institutions. That is why adaptive canal block was developed and has become popular recently. Why adapt adaptive canal block? Anatomical textbooks describe that all the motor branches to the cytoris and quadriceps divide from the femoral nerve before they enter the adaptive canal. That is here. Here, the nerve consists of only saphenous sensory nerve. So the idea behind this block is to perform a conduction block mostly on the sensory branches of the femoral nerve. But what is adductor canal in the first place? The adductor canal is a narrow conical tunnel. It is 10 to 15 centimeters long between the apex of the femoral triangle and the adductor hiatus of the adductor muscle, a uh, magnus. Uh, the canal serves as a passageway of vessels and nerves moving from the anterior side to the posterior leg. However, few people conduct this block as indicated by the name. These two papers published by a group of anesthesiologists who developed this block shows that pain scores after adaptive canal block were similar to those after femoral nerve block but quadriceps muscle strength was more preserved after adaptive canal block compared with uh, femoral nerve block, which is good. However, in the text, they said the block was conducted at the mid-thigh level. What does that mean? Can we call them adaptive canal block? The left-hand side figure shows the mid-thigh level with a red arrow and the proximal end of the adaptive canal with a blue arrow in four different people. So it is clear that the mid thigh level is proximal to the adductor canal. But come to think of it, it makes sense to conduct a block around the mid thigh level because only saphenous nerve runs inside a canal and other nerves such as the nerve to the vastus medialis that are also responsible for new cessation leave the femoral nerve before entering the canal. So in summary, to be accurate, the adductive canal block is the femoral triangle block in most cases. This slide shows a catheter we inserted for continuous adductive canal block at the mid thigh level before surgery. Next, obturator number. As I showed you before, Posterior branch of the obturator nerve is partly responsible for pain in the posterior knee. After coming through the obturator externus, the posterior obturator nerve runs between the pectinus, that is that here, and the adductor brevis, and the adductor brevis and the magnus muscles. So you block the nerve around here or here or whatever. It is also very easy uh, block to perform. Some previous studies have shown that obturator block is worth conducting. For example, in this study, 
he also compared a single femoral triangle block alone, combined single femoral triangle block and obturator nerve block, and local infiltration analgesia. And they found that adding obturator nerve block to femoral triangle block significantly reduced pain as well as opioid consumption compared with a single femoral triangle block or local infiltration analgesia. So in conclusion, obturator nerve block can help when it is combined with femoral triangle block for post-operative analgesia after total knee osteoplasty. As I showed before, a part of the anterior knee joint and most of the posterior part are innervated by tibial and common perianal nerves. So it makes sense that sciatic nerve block, sciatic nerve block uh, has been conducted together with other nerve blocks, such as femoral triangle block. Both proximal and distal approaches have been used for the sciatic nerve block. Some people, uh, some people question the importance of posterior knee pain after total knee uh, osteoplasty. However, evidence tells its importance. For example, in this study, patients undergoing total knee osteoplasty who receive spinal anesthesia and continuous femoral nerve block were divided into three groups to receive proximal sciatic nerve block, distal sciatic nerve block, and no block. The results showed that the proportion of patients who experienced moderate, moderate to severe posterior knee pain at six hours was 80% without sciatic nerve block, but fewer than 20% when proximal or distal sciatic nerve block was conducted. Anterior knee pain was also significantly less frequent after the addition of sciatic nerve block. Previous clinical studies have compared many different uh, regional techniques. This network meta-analysis evaluated those different regional techniques and ranked them based on pain scores, opioid consumption, and uh, range of motion after total knee osteoplasty. And the authors found that conducting multiple nerve blocks was more effective than any single nerve block. And the combination of femoral nerve block and sciatic nerve block was the best approach. Conducting multiple peripheral nerve blocks has been a common practice in many major orthopedic centers. This very recent study was conducted to see if dexamethasone prolonged the analgetic effects of a combination of sciatic nerve, femoral nerve, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, and of genital nerve blocks and IV dexamethasone in patients undergone total knee osteoplasty. The results show that the combination of these nerve blocks worked really well. And more than 60% of the patients did not receive additional analgesics for 20 hours postoperatively, regardless of uh, dexamethasone. However, like femoral nerve block, sciatic nerve block is associated with drawbacks, such as undesirable motor block of the leg. In 2012, Dr. Sinha presented a new technique called IPAC uh, block at an ASA meeting in San Diego. I think this was a kind of a game changer. Similar to sciatic nerve block, IPAC showed for the uh, infiltration between the popliteal artery and the capsule of the knee, targets nerves that are responsible for pain in the posterior knee. But as opposed to sciatic nerve block, this block is expected to block only the terminal sensory branches and spear the main trunks of the common perineal and tibial nerves. Does the injected inject expand enough to reach the articular branches in the popliteal region? This cadaveric study observed the dye spread distribution, and they found that dye injections produce dye spread in the popliteal uh, region and extensive staining of the articular branches. Does IPAC block work as expected? That is, in the presence of 
single or continuous adapter cannot block. Does the iPad block improve pain relief? This review analyzed the results of previous clinical studies and found that the additional benefits of iPad block were apparent, especially when local inflation analgesia was not conducted. Another recent review also shows that in conjunction with single or continuous adaptive canal block, the iPad block may be superior to local inflation analgesia. And even in the presence of in local inflation analgesia, iPad block has additional analgesic effects. However, iPad block was not, is not perfect either. Local anesthetic injection is made only around the articular terminal branches. So no spread is expected to result, uh, reach the sciatic nerve itself. However, the result of a recent study showed that that is not the case. In the study shown in this slide, the analgetic effect of IPAC was inferior to the tibial nerve block, especially when IPAC block was conducted at the proximal site. In addition, IPAC produced sciatic nerve block in some patients. My personal experience also tells that more than 5% of patients receiving IPAC block develop moral weakness in the ankle. This is a video showing how we conduct IPAC block and continuous femoral triangle blocks in our institution. We keep a patient in the supine position with the leg slightly flexed and the extent loaded. We conduct iPad block first. You can see the needle coming from the right side, I mean, anterior side, to reach between the popliteal artery and femur. You can see um, the medial epicondyle there. The injection is being made after injection. We pull the needle and then we conduct. Uh, femoral triangle block at the mid thigh level. The needle is coming through the uh, sartorius muscle. Here, and after a pop, you can inject local anesthetic. And this. Then we put uh, inside a catheter in the space we made in the open. We just are pushing in the catheter. I leave the tip of the caster inside of the space we made. Then uh, we check to see if the caster tip is located <clears throat> in the right place by injecting a solution and air. Now you can see the uh, Air injected. As I showed you before, genicular nerves are sensory nerve branches in the knee joint. Early papers have described radio frequency ablation and blockade of genicular nerves to treat severe front pain in the knee. Recently, some researchers have started using this technique to treat post-operative pain after total neoplasty. For this purpose, the targets of genital nerve blocks are a superior medial, inferior medial, and superior lateral, superior lateral genital nerves. The inferior lateral genital nerve blocks should not be conducted because the site of injection is very close to the common perineal nerve. This video shows how we conduct genital nerve blocks superior medial, and again, inferior medial, genital nerve blocks. Genital nerve runs 
on the, uh, this is a, a superior uh, medial adjunctal nerve runs on the sur surface of the femur. So you inject on the surface, uh, local, on the surface of the femur. Then, inferior and uh, medial adjunctal nerve here lines on the surface of tibia. You cannot see the nerve. It's very tiny nerve. So that... This is a retros retrospective study conducted to uh, see if genital nerve uh, genital nerve box alone were effective pain relief after uh, total knee osteoplasty. The authors uh, compared genital nerve box and local infiltration anesthesia in patients who received spinal anesthesia. And they found that the two techniques uh, offer similar pain relief when used alone. Here. This slide shows the first randomized study conducted to see if adding genital nerve blocks to a combination of uh, continuous adductor canal block and IPAC block improved post-operative anesthesia further. The authors compared two groups of patients who received genital nerve blocks using bupivacaine or sedine. They found that opioid consumption for 24 hours was significantly lower in the block group compared with the sham or saline group. Pain scores were also lower at six hours in patients who received genital nerve blocks. So the result, so the result suggests that genital nerve blocks may improve pain relief when combined with IPAC and adductor canal block. Should we include genital nerve blocks in a group of uh, routine blocks? Sorry. Routine blocks uh, for total knee arthroplasty? I think it's too early to tell the answer. In this study, no initial bolus injection was made for addiction, adaptive canal block before continuous infusion. And the decrease in pain intensity was observed only for six hours. Genital nerve block is an easy uh, technique for sure, but adding this block to other blocks may be redundant too much and the benefit may be limited. So I'm not sure if the blocks will be shared to stay. We need to have many studies, clinical studies, to prove this is important block. In this lecture, I have shared the latest information on these blocks. Based on the benefits and the risks of each technique, here is the pain management protocol in my institution. Our first choice is a combination of continuous adaptive canal block, I mean femoral triangle block, and IPAC block, unless requested otherwise. Continuous infusion of levovir time is continued for one to two days, depending on the patient. However, the best practice depends on many factors. Expectation of a patient should be different, and surgeons are different. The skills you have are also different. So there's no such a thing as the best practice for everyone. You should find your own uh, best practice that works for you and your institution and your patient. That pretty much finishes what I'd like to talk about today. Thank you for your kind attention. So for the Q&A, uh, we'll have um, Professor Sakura, myself, and Justin, if you're still around. Yeah, Christine is there. So. Okay, so uh, so far we have a few questions for Professor Kamaka. So uh, a few attendees are quite interested in comparing power for table block versus other blocks, for example, erector spiny block and also serratus anterior block for uh, analgesia and also anesthesia for uh, breast surgeries. So what are your thoughts on those blocks, Professor Kamaka? Okay, let me first address the question about uh, serratus plane block or the... Now, if you're using it for analgesia, 
I think the evidence randomized studies will say that yes, it is a it provides effective analgesia uh, after breast surgery. Today, there is not much literature on long term outcomes with the relation to some of these um, uh, serratus plane blocks and the PEX blocks, etc. Now, when comparing to ESP for surgical anesthesia, I have to say there are some publications uh, as case reports. And more recently, I have also um, been um, witness to a publication describing it in conjunction with sedation. I think given that a technique, we still don't know much about its mechanism of action. I think uh, as uh, as a researcher, I would say, and with a track record of experience in this field for over two decades, I think it is hard to believe that an ESP block with conjunction with sedation will provide surgical anesthesia for primary breast cancer surgery when we have been struggling with the use of uh, multi-level paravertebral blocks for for so long. Uh, but nevertheless, there are there is a you know, more research to be done in this area. And uh, very soon you will uh, you will be able to um, preview many of the work that will be described in relation to some of the perispinal injections and how uh, an ESP plane block actually produces its, uh, its mechanism of action in relation to anesthesia or analgesia. This is all uh, I may say at this very moment, but if you ask me, would I do an ESP block for a for surgical anesthesia? The answer is no, no, never. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Professor Kamaka. The other question is also directed to you. So it is from Dr. Sammy L. B. Marksend. So uh, how much time do you need to do all those sex injections plus for the paravertebral block plus the um, pectoral injection, and are the surgeons actually happy for the time that you spent on these blocks? Yeah, I think uh, that's a very good question, and I think it's very valid. Um, we do them in a, in a procedure room, which is adjacent to our operating room. So these procedures start more than half an hour to an hour before the end of uh, the ongoing surgery. So as I mentioned, we do uh, multi-level injections, three injections, T2, T4, T6, with uh, seven to eight mils of local anesthetic with uh, added epinephrine. Somebody asked the question, how much epinephrine do you add? We use it in a concentration of one in 200,000. This is not to increase the duration, it is to increase or reduce the systemic absorption of the drug. And those of you who are interested can look up our paper in anesthesiology many years ago, um, demonstrating that paravertebral injection is like giving a drug IV. Your peak concentrations that develop after a paravertebral injection is just like a simulated injection of an IV uh, infusion. By, by, by giving epinephrine, you can reduce the systemic absorption, particularly the early systemic absorption uh, and, uh, and thereby potential for toxicity, especially with multi-level injections when you are performing um, multiple injections with large volumes. Multiple injections mean multiple chances of vascular injection, which as I mentioned, if you inject saline as a, as a, as a test bolus, you can almost exclude it. I haven't actually seen Touchwood uh, an intravascular injection in, in more than a decade now uh, of use of ultrasound with ultrasound guided, even with paravertebrals. Next is uh, uh, the epinephrine um, may act as an intravascular marker, which again, if you don't inject intravascular mark, then you don't need it. So uh, these are uh, this is this is how I would address it. Now, uh, do the surgeons <laughs> do the surgeons um, uh, uh, agree to that? I think it has to be uh, a team-based effort. If you just do it occasionally and you do it um, uh, uh, without um, much planning, then I think it'll never be popular. It has to be introduced uh, uh, slowly and introduced over a period of time. Today, we have more than two decades of experience with our surgeons, so much so that it is never even questioned whether we are going to do a multi-level uh, injection paravertebral block, as long as when they perform the surgery, <coughs> they are able to complete the surgery effectively without patients um, uh, you know, complaining later on what was done and so on and so forth. They see the, 
the beneficial effects after surgery when, uh, in fact, in the PACU, they are almost um, awake, alert, pain-free. And once they go back to the ward, they are eating, drinking. And with, um, uh, as I mentioned, we don't put any catheters anymore. They get uh, oral uh, non-steroidal analgesics with paracetamol uh, and uh, any anti-emetics if required. So etrococcyp is our go-to for most of these um, uh, in the post-operative period with the paracetamol and even if required, some tramadol uh, uh, as a rescue post-operatively. But very rarely it is required. And this together um, has helped us immensely in uh, fast tracking many of these patients through our operating room uh, with a very expedited recovery in some cases. Okay. Um, so another question concerning breast surgery, so is from an anonymous attendee. So when breast, uh, primary breast cancer surgery is simultaneously performed with breast free flap reconstruction surgery, so how does the paravertebral block affect the blood flow to the flap anastomosis? And also can a lower thoracic paravertebral block spread caudal to cover the lumbar area of the flap side as well? Yes, I think uh, that's a very good question. Um, paravertebral block itself has been shown to improve uh, blood flow to flaps many, many years ago. There are some literature relating to that. Because of its uh, uh, ipsilateral sympathetic blocking effects, and if you look at the, um, the, uh, the sympathetic supply to these areas, they're often from the lower thoracic, uh, or thoracic dermatomes or from where these um, sympathetic supplies uh, come. So uh, if you perform uh, a paravertebral block, um, yes, it will, uh, it will improve the blood supply to these areas uh, and can be uh, an added benefit of performing paravertebral, not only for analgesia, but also for the sympathetic effects. Similarly for, <laughs> or particularly if you do latissimus, dorsi flaps, et cetera, this can be a beneficial. But when I do tram flaps, tram flaps are more extensive involving um, the abdomen and an incision that is really long, uh, I usually do epidurals uh, in these patients and because uh, positioning them post-operatively um, is also very important and the surgical positioning that they maintain to reduce any tension on, the, on these um, uh, abdominal uh, muscle flaps uh, are, are an integral part of their management. So if you, if you have a patient who is in, in a lot of pain, uh, and uh, or um, having a lot of nausea, vomiting, it's not desirable. So I find, uh, but for um, when it's, uh, say, a tram flap, I do uh, epidurals, and surely with it, you will have uh, increased um, blood supply, blood flow, etc. But also for the other traps flaps, like the latissimus dorsi flaps, paravertebral blocks can be a good choice. Yeah. Oh, so thank you, Professor Kamaka. The other question will be directed to uh, Professor Sakura. So um, in your opinion, so you have talked about many blocks for uh, concerning uh, knee replacement. So in your opinion, what would be the best block to give as analgesia for this operation? You mean... Uh... Uh, when, when it comes to pain relief only, so... You, you can give femoral block when you think about the quality of analgesia, I mean, intensity of analgesia, but uh, in today's environment, I think you should at least uh, conduct a single adductor canal block. If you can conduct, uh, if you can use a, a catheter, you can uh, insert a catheter to give continuous infusion uh, after borders uh, adductor canal block. And uh, I mean, uh, femoral triangle block. And if you can, you can add IPEC, IPEC block. So my uh, first choice is uh, always continuous adductive canal block. I mean, femoral triangle block and IPEC. Uh, may I just question? interrupt here for a moment? Uh, I have a I have a question for Sakura San here. Mm -hmm. um, you describe all these different techniques and uh, the tibial um, nerve blocking potential of uh, the IPAC. Um, you do not allude to the fact of this popliteal plexus block that uh, also innervates most of the posterior capsule, and being a periarterial 
injection. It's a very simple technique and just more or less a, a lower extension of the uh, adductor canal block. Any comments on that? You mean the, uh, uh, I haven't tried that technique by myself. So I cannot say uh, for sure, I can say uh, what, the, what difference they have uh, between the two. But I think uh, IPEC block, when it's done in the, at the very uh, distal level, you can, you, uh, there's a little chance, very little chance of getting a cytokine block after surgery. So that, uh, yeah, under the blocks, the other groups are suggest, uh, proposing is a little bit uh, prof uh, deep block, I think. I've never tried so that I, so I, yeah, maybe uh, someone help me to help me uh, suggest, uh, you know. Yeah, I, I do it uh, quite frequently, actually. I, I use a popliteal plexus as opposed to an IPAC block because first of all is, you need a lot of volume for the IPAC relative to a, of, of the popliteal plexus. The uh, objective of popliteal plexus is that the posterior capsular innervation all come from the sciatic components and they form a plexus uh, that is uh, periplexus. It's around the, uh, the popliteal artery. So while the IPAC injection is close to the capsule and anterior or more distal to the artery, here you are just doing a perivascular injection after the after the uh, uh, femoral artery has exited the um, the adductor hiatus uh, at the distal part of the adductor canal. Mm -hmm. uh, you just inject. Uh, we inject about ten mils of uh, zero point two five percent, or even 0.2 percent, in many times, and it seems to work. Uh, it seems seems to provide the analgesia we need. Or sciatic nerve block relates sciatic nerve related innervation. Now uh, there are very few um, published literature relating to that. I think the Scandinavian group actually described this by Dr. Benston and them, but they don't seem to have followed up with any randomized control trials. This is my comment. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I Thank think you that's all for now from the floor. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, thanks to uh, Justin, Dr. Professor Ko, and Professor Sakura. Yeah, I it's just realized good, uh, that my my volume my my volume is a little bit lower. I accidentally hit the <laughs> hit the button that reduced uh, my volume. Sorry about that. I think uh, uh, others have managed to increase their own volume, so that that's fine. Sunny Shinichi, no problem with that. Thank you again for this wonderful presentations. <clears throat> We're going to have a short break, after which we will come back and uh, uh, and have another a potpourri of uh, another few varieties about the hip hip joint. So don't go away. Uh, just go and have your favorite beverage and be back in fifteen minutes time. Starts now. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>
Okay, welcome back. Right. Okay, so now we have another session of three other presentations. It gives me great pleasure to reintroduce you to Dr. Chris Vermeulen. He comes all the way from AZ Tunhout in Belgium. As I introduced him before, he's not only a champion of regional anesthesia, he has many other attributes from cycling, fast cars, adventure, helicopters, and God knows what else. Nevertheless, uh, without further ado, Chris, it's my pleasure to welcome you. Take it away. So uh, Professor Kramaker asked me to, to say something about a fascia iliaca compartment block and um, try to just, yeah, okay. Uh, I have no conflicts of in interest. Uh, actually, I do have one conflict of interest. Is the fact that I did my PhD on the fascia iliaca compartment might benefit a little bit in my talk, uh, yeah, just for making some promotion for the fascia iliaca compartment block, of course. But uh, other than that, I don't have anything special that I have to uh, announce. So uh, who am I? I'm Chris Vermeil. I'm coming from Belgium. For those who don't know where Belgium is in Europe and it's between the Netherlands, England, France, and uh, Germany somewhere. And I'm living in Antwerp. I'm working in, in Turnhout, which is close by to Antwerp. And Antwerp is known for its big port, one of the biggest ports in the world. But we are probably more known for our paintings, our beer, and our chocolate. And actually the painting, the, 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 the picture on the, um, left here is the place where we are now because we are actually currently holding our refresher uh barra like this is the the, the belgian association uh, we, we're holding this uh refresher course on uh, regional anesthesia uh, as we speak so um i had to divide my a little bit my time a little bit but i'm very happy to be here of course um if we want to talk about hip surgery, we know that hip surgery is much more than just the, the, the surgery itself. We're talking about orthogeriatrics. We're talking about a high incidence of surgery. We're talking about ARIS protocols, prospect guidelines, a lot of therapeutic possibilities, uh, cognitive dysfunction, delirium, and so on and so on. So me talking about therapeutic possibilities and then talking about the fascia iliaca alone is only just one part of the whole subject of hip surgery, of course. Um, we have seen that a variety of regional anesthesia techniques have been shown to improve analgesia after uh, or for hip surgery. And of course, the most important thing of regional anesthesia is the knowledge of the nerve corresponding to the surgical site. So we have a lot of nice articles for the, the hip innervation. And I think that uh, the, the following two speakers also are going to speak some about these uh, anatomy um, things. So I will not uh, go into that too much, but um, we know in general that we have an anterior innervation and that we have a posterior innervation. And the anterior is of course the femoral and the obturator nerve, and the posterior is the sciatic and some smaller nerves. Um, the main players of the regional anesthesia techniques are the posterior approaches of the lumbar plexus and the anterior approaches. And the anterior approaches are the much more favored uh, approaches. Um, a long, long time, a lot of people did some femoral blocks, femoral nerve blocks for hip surgery because it was also uh, in the, the prospect guidelines, which are the pros procedure specific guidelines for postoperative analgesia in some kind of uh, field. Um, and that was the, 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 the prospect guideline in 2010 still had uh, the nerve, the, the femoral nerve block in it. Now the new guidelines uh, also uh, included the fascia iliaca compartment block. The new guidelines are uh, were published uh, last year and um, the fascia iliaca compartment is actually an old block which got some new interest since the superior supraingual approach was um, that yeah, was, was uh, published and, and, and well known to uh, a lot of people. Uh, then we have the, the, the really new uh, pain block. And I'm sure that because I'm also a very big fan of pain block, some people think that I don't like the pain block because it's a little bit contrast to the fascia leg, but that's not true. And I think that if, if uh, the pain block was described a little bit earlier, it might have also been uh, included in the new prospect guidelines. 
So the anterior is the much is, is the is the approach which has been used the most, I think. We also have the posterior uh, approaches. The psoas compartment block is is the more classic one. It was still in the prospect guideline in 2010, but it, it got out in 2000 um, to uh, 2019. Uh, and um, for me personally, during my uh, training. I, I never did actually a lot of psoas compartment blocks because I was taught that it's a, it's a, it's a dangerous block that you can have uh, epidural spread, but you can have a lot of also infections and bleedings and things like that. So I was not trained uh, very well in the psoas compartment block. And then you have some new kits on the block, the QL and the ESP. Uh, we already talked a little bit about the ESP in the, in the session before this. Um, I think those blocks are still, yeah, they still have to prove themselves, I think. I don't know, I don't want to, to, to go into that too much because I didn't see very big studies yet. So, um, and that will probably be a uh, subject of, of another talk by somebody else, of course. Um, so which technique should we choose? And if I look at the prospect guidelines for the hips, and I already uh, told you that the new guidelines were published last year, that you see that the single shot fascia iliaca compartment block or even local infiltration is um, one of the uh, overall recommendations. And again, I think if we would have been a little bit earlier with the peng block, this would, peng block would also be um, included in this. So maybe for the next guidelines, who knows, uh, we can, we can I do that as well. But I was asked to, a uh, long introduction, I was asked to say something about the fascia iliac compartment block. And let me say so first something about the history. The history, uh, it's already a long history. And it's actually the first time it was described was by uh, Professor Winnie. And at that time, it was a blind technique. It was an infra inguinal technique. Um, and over the years evolved to, to an ultrasound guided approach, but still transverse uh, approach. And in 2011, it was Hebert uh, who um, described the infra, the supra inguinal approach and the longitudinal approach. And I, I was very intrigued by this uh, approach. And that's why I started my PhD doing um, this, using this approach for my studies. Now, if we talk about the fascia iliac compartment, it's very important to define what the fascia iliac compartment actually is. Because if you know what the, 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 the compartment is, you can understand it much easier. The fascia iliac compartment is nothing more than, than like a virtual tunnel which is formed on the posterior side by the psoas and the iliacus muscle, on the anterior side by the fascia iliaca without being attached to the muscles. And in between you have the nerves, you have the, the, the vessels and things like that. So you can imagine if you put a local anesthetic in this virtual tunnel, it is important where you put this local anesthetic. If you put it here, or if you put it here, or and it can make a very big difference uh, because of the an 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 anatomic structures, and it is clear as well that if it, if it is like a very big compartment, the volume that you will put in it is very important too. So we, in, for my PhD, we did a good anatomy study. We, we looked at a lot of uh, cross sections, uh, high resolution images. And um, if you wanted to know which uh, nerves you wanted to block in the fascia compartment, we came to across, of course, the femoral nerve, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, and the obturator nerve. Now I know that the obturator nerve is a big um, discussion in the fascia iliac compartment, and I will talk about that later. But what we saw and what other people also described is that if you can put the local anesthetic high enough in the fascia iliac compartment, and that would mean above the level of L5 as one, but because that is the, the level where the obturator nerve pierces the fascia iliac compartment, and then uh, it's uh, in, you, you can't reach it anymore. So you can, you can imagine if you put only local anesthetic here, it will not work or it will work, but it will not reach the obturator nerve. Now, what about the history of those nerve anatomy? Actually, nothing is new of this history because these nerves like the femoral nerve, obturator nerve, and even the lower and the higher and the, the accessory obturator was already described in 1948. So that's not new. There were a lot of anatomy studies. And again, I hope that the next two speakers are going to speak about those uh, also. Um, a lot of anatomy studies and a lot of sensory innervation studies. And they all came across the fact that it's just very difficult innervation. And it's very difficult to have a good summary of um, how the innervation is done. So um, again, uh, 
no, uh, new studies also uh, looked at it at these nerves and saw that the femoral high, femoral low, obturator high, obturator low nerves were uh, described. Obsessive, the, the, uh, also other nerves were described. But the new thing about it is that they were looking now at the mechanoreceptors and sensory fibers as well for uh, determining where the most local anesthetic should go. In other words, the place where the most receptors are is the place where you could find um, or, or you, you should get your local anesthetic. And these studies showed that for the capsule and for the labrum, the most receptors are on the anterior side. A long story to conclude that uh, we should get a local anesthetic on the anterior side of the hip. And um, therefore, the, and the uh, anterior approaches are much uh, more uh, favorable. Now, if we look at uh, the fact if the fascia iliac compartment is a good alternative for a post analgesia, we have to look at some studies. And this is one of the studies we did. And we saw that we had uh, a reduce of, of morphine consumption, not only after 24 hours, but also 48 hours, uh, which half. So it, we, we could conclude that there was a big um, reduction in uh, morphine consumption. So the effectiveness of the block would be OK. Uh, also, not only for the, the morphine consumption, but also the the, analog, the, the, the pain scores were much lower in uh, the first hours and 24 hours postoperatively. So we could say that we are talking about an, the, of an effective block. But as I mentioned already before, it is important to have um, the right volume and the right uh, approach, of course. So uh, what we uh, uh, looked at in another study is um, that we, um, if we were looking at the, the classical approach, which is the supra-inguinal approach, the infra approach, and we compared it to our supra-inguinal approach, then we saw that it is important to get the local anesthetic as proximal as possible. So putting the local anesthetic underneath the, the ligament inguinal, then you will not have a good spread. And this is what we saw when we injected 40 ml of local anesthetic, uh, and we compared the supra-inguinal and the infra-inguinal approach, not only did the local anesthetic reach much higher? It also, the volume was much higher um, when, when in, the, in the higher compartments. So the effectiveness of the supra-inguinal approach is much better than the infra-inguinal approach. And that's why we want to uh, yeah, suggest that the supra-inguinal is superior. We have also the influence of injection volume. Of course, we know that it is, uh, I already explained to you that we have a long virtual tunnel. So it's important to get enough uh, local anesthetic in this tunnel. And we did another study for that. And we saw a study that we would need at least 40 mLs to get the local anesthetic all the way to the different um, nerves. Um, this was a cadaver research, and I'll, I also know that a lot of people uh, always doubt a little bit cadaver research because then it's uh, uh, we should do it on, 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 on like real patients. But also studies afterwards showed that, uh, and I will come to that later, studies also showed that uh, you have to have a high volume. So high volume for some people is dangerous for toxicity, but we come to that later as well. So for approach and for volume, I think we should go for a superangular approach and at least 40 ml of local anesthetic. Now something, it's not that new anymore, but it's not, it's thing not have been um, uh, researched a lot, um, is, is the fact that you uh, also should take into account um, the biodynamics. And the biodynamics is, uh, first of all, for those who read, who, who read this, this article, this is a very good article, uh, back to the basic of the, the fascia plane box. And uh, to understand the biodynamics, it's important that you can uh, look at these as well. Now, what we want to, to, to look at is the fact that you have intraoperative movement of, of the leg. So we, we asked a surgeon to mimic uh, a, sur a surgery of hip. Uh, and what we did, it was, so one side, we didn't, uh, at, at one side, we, we 
didn't move the patient and the other side, we did some uh, yeah, passive movements. And then we put the patient on the MRI and actually it was not the patient, it was myself. Um, we saw that with passive mobilization of the leg, the, the local anesthetic got much higher and uh, the volume also got much uh, in, more intense in the upper region. So this is only a little pilot study, but it proved that per operative movement, and especially in orthopedic surgery where there are a lot of movement and a lot of traction and, and, and things like that, are important for the spread of the local anesthetic. And there aren't, aren't any studies looking at that uh, on this moment. So I think that maybe the for the fascia iliaca, it is very important to look at the fact that during the operation, the local anesthetic might go more proximal, and maybe that's the reason why the obturator nerve is blocked uh, anyway. So this is, uh, I think, a base for a lot of more studies, and uh, I think it's very interesting and very new, actually. Now, like for everything, you always have the believers, and we have the non-believers, like you have the, the people who are getting a vaccination and the anti-vaxxers. And uh, I think that's important too, because you have to have a good discussion. And the ongoing discussions for the fascia iliac compartment block at this time is um, there are four main things. The role of the obturator nerve already told you something about it. Second, we have the fact that we are using a large volume. We have the fact of the motor block, and we have also block failure because none of us is uh, the most perfect guy in performing blocks. So once in a while, we'll have a block failure as well. Let us start with the obturator nerve. Some people are determined to, to, to prove that the obturator nerve is not blocked with the fascia iliac compartment. It has been a very interesting discuss, discussion, and we have been, been, been talking about that very much. But um, on the other side, you always have the pros and the cons. And we also did a lot of anatomy research, and we did uh, find that we could block the, the obturator nerve. But I think it's important to have the discussion going, because then we, st we, we keep on thinking about where the nerves are and if we can reach them, of course, and what the difference is with cadaver research, which clinical uh, implications are important, and also the effect, of course. Um, the obturator nerve might not even be so important for the hip surgery, because in this study, you see that, that they conclude that the obturator nerve does not have an effect on uh, analgesic uh, benefits in the hip surgery. So maybe all the discussion about the obturator nerve is all obsolete. Second thing is the large volume. I know we have to use a lot of volume, and that's at least 40 ml. Uh, but if you use low concentrations, and we did some, some plasma concentration studies uh, also, we saw that we didn't reach any toxic levels. We didn't reach any uh, neurological or cardiac symptoms whatsoever. So we can conclude that it's quite safe to use uh, 40 mLs. And we did in this study, we used 40 mLs of 0.5 uh, percent. But in fact, in clinical basis, we're using only 0.25. So we could use even more uh, uh, local anesthetic if we want. Um, in this study, they looked at the, the it was also a cadaver study, and they looked at the minimum effective volume, and they came across the fact that they should use, uh, that a uh, volume of 26 ml should be um, injected to reach the obturator nerve. But if you see, if you use 26 ml, uh, for, uh, 62 ml, this is like, like an ocean of, of local anesthetic around the obturator nerve. So maybe 40 or 50 will be enough too, because we have the clinical effect. Again, you will always have the believers and the non-believers. And in a uh, letter to the to the article of this article of this uh, cadaver research, uh, somebody said that it was an artificial passage of, passage of the local anesthetic and it could not be reached. Well, there is also clinical studies. There are also clinical studies proving that the obturator nerve is reached. So. Um, Another thing is you have to use and another another thing in the letters they said. Oh, uh, it was not reached by 30, 40 mLs. No, of course, because you need 60 mLs. And then they say, yeah, but if you use more than 40 mLs, it can be toxic. On the other hand, same people have been studying or have been publishing studies using 60 mLs. So you always have the pros and the cons. What thing, one thing which is uh, clear with the fascia iliaca is that you have a motor block. Uh, you have a motor block and you would rather have not a motor block, of course, because the ideal regional anesthesia technique is easy to perform. It's good uh, a good analgesia, a low concentration of local anesthetic, so you don't have uh, too much toxicity. 
are long lasting action and no motor block, of course. And um, the paint block is a solution for, for this motor block, I think. And for those who are not familiar with, with uh, these movies, they are very nice. They're, they're all produced by, by Jeff Katzen. Um, and he has a Blocktober. And if you have the time, if you, if, if you want to look at them, they're really my, nice movies. And uh, Jeff made uh, a movie of every block. So if you want to uh, look at it, and maybe uh, you already did, but it's very good for um, learning all those different blocks. What he showed also is that, and that will explain, of course, the motor block, is that the paint block will uh, work directly on the, on the on the hip joint as well, and I'm, I'm, I'm definitely that 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 Dr. Peng will, will talk about that much more. Instead of the fascia iliaca, it, it's much more proximal, so it's normal that you have uh, more motor block, of course. And this was proven in this uh, comparative study that you could see that. Uh, there was a, a quadriceps motor block at three hours. For the pain block, it was only 45%, like for the fascia iliaca, which was 90%. At six hours for the fascia iliaca, we still at 85, and uh, it was only 25 by the pain. So you do have a little bit of motor block with the pain block, but I think that's much more, um, yeah, individual uh, differences, because I think in the trained hand, you don't even probably will not have that much of motor block. And I, I think that uh, Dr. Peng will uh, talk about that more. In the same study, they also, shows, also showed that the postoperative pain scores are the same, that the opioid consumption um, is not different, ability to form physiotherapy. And we know that physiotherapy is important for, uh, if you start physiotherapy early, early the first day of green for 24 hours, then you can uh, reduce um, uh, hospital stay, of course. Uh, no significant difference between opiate related side effects or the length of hospital stay. So I think pain block is a very good alternative uh, if you are a little bit scared of the motor block. Um, motor block is something which is, I think, very difficult to measure because it most of the time it's subjective, subjective uh, scales. It can be influenced by pain, whether it's an allergic induced motor block or the influence of bandages or things like that. So I think it's very difficult to have a good idea what the motor block uh, actually is and how it is um, performed to or how it is studied. So that's why we're doing a new study now. And uh, instead of just asking subjectual skills, we are going to use uh, like a dynamic manometer and just measure how Newton, how much Newton is lost by uh, performing blocks. Um, and then we have the last one. And the last one is block failure. And we all think we don't have any failures. And if you look at the efficiency of different studies, the, uh, the efficiency is very good. So, uh, but then I want to um, ask you all, uh, how many of you ask for residual pain? Uh, if you put in a, a, a block, do you still ask the patient if he has pain and, and where the pain exactly is situated? And how do you test these hip blocks? Because I want to present you this uh, case. Uh, it was a male, uh, 85 years old, and he slipped on the ice. He, he broke his uh, hip. He got on the ICU, he got a, a regional technique, and in this case, it was a, was a pain block. And when I asked him uh, how the pain was doing, he said, ah, my pain in, in, on the, in the front of my, my hip is much better, but I, I, now I have pain at, at the posterior part. And then uh, I didn't say posterior part, but he said at, at my buttocks, uh, I have a lot of pain at my buttocks now. So the anterior pain is completely gone. And if we are looking at the reasons or, or the, the, the where the pain is coming from, we can have a lot of other reasons, not only for the hip, but you can also have uh, hematoma of muscles and, and things like that. So sometimes you see that the pain or the pain sensation can move. And um, in, the, in our case, we saw that the pain moved from the anterior side to the buttocks. And if we look at the innovation of the buttock, we see that it's actually more the sacral plexus. So what uh, I want to ask you to which nurse should we, we focus on? Because not every hip fractured patient is operated at the same day. Some uh, have anticoagulants and are just for the program. They have to wait for the next day. So what do we do? Do we just give them an anterior block? And, and if they have some residual posterior pain, pain we just give them, uh, I don't know, some uh, paracetamol or what? Or can we combine it with something posteriorly? Uh, therefore, should we more should we focus more on some segmental innovation, or should we 
focus on more the dermatomes in, in, in looking at um, the approach of, of, of the regional anesthesia technique. So this explanation is uh, that, that you might not have block failure when the pain is moving from the anterior side to the posterior side. And therefore, uh, we wanted to look at some posterior innovation a little bit more. And I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, I am not going to enter any details, but I already told you that while I was not very uh, fond of the, the, the classical posterior approaches because I didn't learn them very well and because I'm afraid of the adverse effects. But uh, going back to the drawing board, we try to find a new posterior in gluteal uh, approach. And I hope to, to tell you about that more in, 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 in future. Um, but what we did do, and this is some, some um, MRI studies already, this, this, you see that putting in the local anesthetic on the posterior side, you could reach the sacral plexus. And this is just going from proximal down, and this is the anterior posterior side. So we'll, we'll, I will talk about that later because it's not really the fascia leg compartment, but, but it is important if you want to evaluate, evaluate your block failure of, for instance, the fascia iliaca or the pengbo. So I think it's very important not only to speak about the blocks themselves, like fascia iliaca, pain block, but to speak about anterior and posterior compartments. And I think we have some work to do, and like we have already have the nomenclature Delphi consensus about the truncal fascia plane, I think we have to have those of uh, the hip region and also maybe the brachial plexus. Uh, and that's a work in progress for uh, the future. We did a little um, pilot study. We did a few uh, patients already and uh, coming in with a fracture on the uh, ER, we performed a pain block and they had a, a big reduction, a significant reduction in pain uh, after the pain block, but we also combined it with our posterior approach and we saw that the pain was even much less. So I think that is something we have to look in the, in the near future. And uh, the happy coincidence is that uh, Professor Peng is also busy with some posterior approaches and um, the, the, not, this, not the next talk, but the talk afterwards, he will, um, they will explain that for us. So that's very interesting, and I hope in future we might get together to to somehow do a, a study together on these posterior approaches. But for now, um, I'm still a very big fan of the fascia iliaca. Of course, I'm a fan of the pain block, but uh, Professor Peng will talk about that later. I think it's important not to focus too much on the nerve technique itself, but we should focus more on uh, the scenarios, on the, the, the compartment, the anterior and posterior compartments. And we know that pain is not only the bone, it's not only the fascia, but it's the skin, the muscle, the fascia and the bone. So I think our post-operative uh, uh, regimen should be involving all those uh, different things too. So to conclude, I'm very happy with my fascia iliaca compartment block. And uh, I'm very happy to see that it's also part of the, the prospect guidelines. Um, once, uh, I don't know uh, if, you, if you ever uh, saw this, this uh, meeting of the ERA UK, and, but uh, the funny thing is that they all asked these famous guys what they wanted to have for their hip, uh, if, they wanted to, if they had a hip fracture, and they all said something different. So there is not one way. I think it's very important to do a technique which you have been doing uh, already quite a long time, which is a good technique. The optimal anesthetic approach of the hip surgery is still a subject of debate. And we know that adequate analgesia is important and essential for a good recovery. And we have a variety which all have been showing to an improved analgesia. And I think the quality of the perform block is much more important than the block itself. For me, I still love my fascia iliaca compartment block, of course. And uh, on that note, I think, um, yeah, that concludes my uh, talk, I think. Thank you, Chris. That was uh, very well put. Um, by the way, I'm also a big fan of your fascia iliaca block. I know. <laughs> I may be old fashioned, but uh, I think, um, as you said, there are a lot of unanswered questions, and when there are such a situation, you must practice what you are most comfortable with. Uh, and really to add some more uh, fuel to the fire on this discussion, uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome back 
Professor Philip Peng. Uh, as I mentioned in my um, in my early introduction, he is truly an innovator. And among one of his innovation is the pericapsular nerve group uh, block that uh, Chris has been alluding to in his presentation. And what better than to hear it from, from Professor Peng. Although he is with us uh, in person, uh, in virtually, but he has elected to send us a recorded presentation. So his presentation we played uh, back to you, but he will be available for the discussion. And uh, please uh, keep your questions coming. Uh, and Christine will uh, pose them to Professor Peng or Chris or Tony later on. Okay, uh, now uh, without further ado, we are going to move on to our next uh, lecture by Professor Peng. Thank you very much, Manoj, uh, for your invitation. Uh, I'm going to talk about not just the uh, pericapsular nerve group block, but I also would like to discuss with you the target pain generator that you can consider in your strategy uh, for the hip analgesia. Uh, this is my disclosure slide, and quite a lot of those slides are coming from these three books, especially the, the new edition of this book, which probably coming uh, by a spring this year. The first area I would like to discuss with you is about the hip analgesia. When we talk about hip surgery, we are talking about a, a heterogeneous group of surgeries. Just even for the hip fractures, it depends on the size of fractures, um, you can have a different type of surgeries. And also we have a total hip alphoplasty for elective osteophytis uh, management, and we have a hip arthroscopy. In general, you can target your uh, pain generator according to this anatomical position like the joint capsule, skin, and soft tissue. Let's talk about the joint capsules. Now, um, different, different strategy can help to deal with the pain coming from the joint, and it's particularly relevant for the preoperative treatment for the pain coming from the hip fracture or hip arthroscopy. So what are the possible sp uh, strategies? You can have a precapsulate uh, uh, nerve group block like a pain block. You can have a surgeon to do the precapsular infiltration, and you can even have intraarticular injections by the surgeon as well. The last two was actually done by the surgeon, and the first one was done by anesthesiologist. So um, I initially thought that the arthroscopy would be a pure model for preoperative uh, control of the analgesia. Until then, the, when I uh, went in, into the operating room and see how the surgeon do the hip arthroscopy, um, in order to perform this well, they use a traction and position device. You can see this is almost similar to those uh, torture device. You can just uh, do something for someone you hate. Um, the, the amount of traction and also the, um, the, the, the big choker they put in certainly cause not just the pain from the joint capsule, maybe the, from the soft tissue around the hip joint as well. Skin um, is a nice summary of all the skin innovation around the skin incisions. So in general, this is actually the larger femoral cutaneous nerve. We think that the incision will be enough, which is not true. Now, probably for the dynamic hip screw, the incision will be right over the lateral femoral cutaneous, which is actually depicted in this picture. But when you talk about intramedullary nail, they involve this color here, which is the iliohypogastric, and also the other different approach, lateral, postlateral, you, uh, and even anterior from the front, you always involve iliohypogastric. Now for the intramedullary nail, you need a little bit of femoral. For the postlateral approach, you need a bit black color here, which is superior corneal nerve. So um, we need a little bit more than just a lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. The question I have is, do we really need a nerve block for the cutaneous related pain? Can we just manage with the multimodal analgesia without doing blocks? The fact is a soft tissue. Now, it, it becomes a little bit tricky. It really depends on the type of surgery. Um, in general, when you say you put a dynamic hip screw, you make an incision here all the way down, what you did is you cut the tension fascia lata, uh, which is not coming from the anything in the anterior from the lumbar plexus is coming from the superior gluteal nerve. Yes, you can go inside and uh, 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 cut some of the muscle for vascular sledge atlas, which is belong to the femoral nerve. Now, when you actually have the total hip alphoplasty, you have a postural approach, you split the gluteus maximus, which is 
also from the uh, from the posterior uh, 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 nerve from the inferior gluteal and superior gluteal nerve, including those uh, from the uh, different small rotator muscle gluteus medius as well. They are all from superior and inferior gluteal nerve and sacral plexus. None of them are from anywhere in the lumbar plexus. Why I keep on saying this because if you actually block the uh, femoral nerve, if you even have the lumbar plexus block, superinguinal or whatever, you won't even touch any of the structure that involved in the soft tissue. What about anterior approach? Anterior approach for the hip, uh, in general in North America, practice in one third of the orthopedic uh, practice. They don't cut the muscle, they split between the sartorius and tensor fascia lata. And here and from there, they expose the anterior capsule and incise the anterior capsule. For this type of procedure, I think will be a perfect candidate for the anterior capsular uh, infiltration. All right, so we talk about the three different possible uh, pain generators. What about pain block? Well, pain block was developed a few years ago because we noticed that there are three groups of articular branches that consistently innervate the anterior capsule. And from there, and we find that the location of these three groups are fairly constant and quite easy to catch. So we think that there is some strategy that we can use for the radio frequency ablation or chemical ablation, for, uh, which is a denervation for the chronic hip pain. For anesthesiologists, we can put a lot of local anesthetic around the anterior capsule, uh, and then we can use it for the preoperative pain control for the hip fractures. That is the reason why we develop, we develop this one. Is there any scientific basis? Well, 2018, we uh, have a very uh, meticulous dissection. We find that quite interesting that the anterior capsules are supplied by three groups of nerve, femoral nerve, alternator nerve, and accessory alternator nerve. And they are very constant in the supply and also in the location. For the femoral nerve, the articular branches, most of them, more than 90% of them, they descend around L4, uh, level and then th from there they leave the femoral nerve and dive deep to the ilicus and then solus muscle and then from deep to the muscle in between the anterior inferior alex spine and iliopipid eminence they actually uh, go directly to capsules it applied for more than 93 percent of those innovation and there is some uh, variance in which we call the low branch that the articular branches that stay with the femoral nerve until in the infra region, they dive directly uh, 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 into or besides the psoas muscle. The second type of nerve is here. You can see the accessory alternate nerve. Uh, this is a cutout. This is where this picture coming from. So you can see this is the iliopipid eminence. The accessory alternate nerve can be seen very consistently caused around the iliopipid eminence. And here uh, you can see the skeleton and, and my arrow point to this alternator foramen. And this is actually the zooming of this picture. The alternator foramen is here and give rise to the anterior and posterior division. Now, the femoral nerve and the alternator, they are separate with some fascia plane, but not the articular branches. The articular branches cause, uh, below this is called the inframedial acetabulum, cause below this and cross to the joint capsule and supply the inferior aspect of the joint capsule. So to summarize, the femoral nerve is very, very abundant, all, supplying all the four quadrants of the femoral head and neck and hip joint. And the accessory alternator supply the medial half and the alternator supply the inferior half. Now, interesting, there is a systemic review and so-called meta-analysis of the hip capsule innovation. Um, and I don't see any contribution or any additional information from what we are talking about. But one thing that's quite interesting, they use a different descriptor to quantity and see whether they are a good study. And uh, sufficient to say, actually, we are the only study that destroy every single nice pawn in all the studies, in all the descriptor. Well, what about posterior capsule? Um, I think this two, 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 one is a systemic review and the other is a recent study from Texas. They shed a light on what are the contribution. Um, these are the free nerve 
nerve to quadrifid morus, superior gluteal nerve, and sciatic nerve. Now, just in case you don't understand, I think the most important message you need to know is the nerve to the nerve to QF is the most prevalent and also consistent supply to the posterior capsule, and is basically is. Uh, along the course, you can easily catch that in the superior posterior capsule. And question is, do we really, really need to look after this? Well, uh, in terms of a histological staining study back in 2012, this study suggests that the fiber that carry the nociceptive fiber, the pain fiber, they are more in the anterior capsule, which basically the pain block is supposed to be, or superlateral, which is ray bearing area. The posterior area, um, most of the fiber actually is actually vast majority of them, they are actually mechanical receptors. So they are not really contributing to the acute pain situation. But we know that the, the pain pathway the, uh, are dynamic. So called mechanical receptor or some receptor that is not even contributing anything, we call silent receptor, with a certain uh, plastic changes. It can become a nociceptive fibers, and and that's what we find. And uh, this is actually a study just published, and based on the 150 patients in Hong Kong who have inoperative uh, hip fracture, so they are, they are left to die, uh, in order to provide a better quality of life. So um, because they cannot have surgery, so um, for the 150 patients, um, they have anterior neurolysis, and then for around 70 to 75% of them, they respond, but the rest of the patient, they, they have a partial response. So this study basically show by adding a posterior capsule neurolysis, we can give a significant uh, analgesia. So it confirms what we just said. I think the posterior capsule in general is not really a major contributor, uh, uh, especially in the acute pain setting. Now, the next question to ask is, what about the needle target relationship? So we go and see whether we can find the target and turn out that it's not that difficult. If you can align the ultrasound probe between the inferior acetabulum, sorry, inferior, sorry, anterior inferior arctic spine and the inferior iliopibic eminence, you can see this two structure and you can see a psoas, you can insert the needle deep to the psoas fascia and you can actually have a spread of local and along along this area. And what, what if you really inject? Well, we find that when we inject 10 cc, it really spread between the AIIS and iliopibic eminence. It doesn't spread much around the inferior capsule, but if you inject 20 cc, and it's quite interesting, if you, we reflect the iliopibic we reflect, retract this up, you find that it's a capsule when you inject 20 cc, it really go to the inferior and middle portion of the capsule. And this is important because this is the one inferior capsule, is where the articular branches of the obtinator reach as well. We are not the only one. Uh, so these are the three articular branches that we need to pay attention: femoral, accessory obtinator, and obtinator. So we are not the only one who describe this. There is an interesting study. They inject dye. And one thing quite interesting, you look at this, when you inject 20 cc, you really actually cover the inferior and middle portion of the capsule. And that I think is, uh, we can really say the pericapsular nerve group block is really pericapsular. It covers the articular branches from femoral, um, uh, accessory obtinator, and obtinator. But one interesting thing you can see from here, it also spread along the trochanteric area. So we know that uh, in, in patients with trochanteric fracture, they also respond fairly well. But we also know that the articular branches only should only cover the intracapsular fracture. Well, what this study show is, what this uh, uh, simple dye study show is, the dye can actually spread to the trochanteric area extra, in the extracapsular space and perform uh, almost like a local anesthetic infiltration around the trochanteric area and block the pink fiber over there. So it's very similar to the local anesthesia, local infiltration anesthesia, and that's the reason why it worked for the trochanteric fracture. What about the clinical evidence? Um, the evidence is mounting since it's just a baby uh, procedure that started in the late 2018. Uh, but the randomized controlled trial is mounting and um, 
I am free to say that in just in the last six months, there are four randomized trials published. They are from four different continents, Australia, Chile, Italy, and India. Um, so I'm going to focus on just in two particular surgical type. One is a hip fracture. The pericardial nerve group block was initially developed for controlling the pain before the surgery because it's very good to deal with pain around the fracture site. Um, and, and this uh, was the initial case series. We find that it's amazing because if we say the blue is the one before the pain at before the block, and after the block, you don't see anything because after the block, the pain at rest is zero, except this one who have a metastatic disease in, in different parts of the body, and, and no matter what, the patient still have some pain. But the pain with movement is the thing that is striking. You see, before and after the block, there was a significant drop in the effect size uh, of the pain score with effect size around 7. This is amazing. There's a huge drop. Now, I, I am fully aware that we cannot compare with the fascia alaka block, which basically in fact inguinal. I'm fully aware we cannot compare head to head. But I just uh, look at those uh, crocking database and also all the uh, randomized control trial using the fascia alaka block and, and basically the infra inguinal. How much they change in the pain with a movement? In general, there are the, the pain difference with the block with movement um, is around 3.6 across the board. So you can see, uh, have, this gives you a kind of an idea how great is the pain block in terms of dropping the, 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 the pain with the movement. Now, this, uh, this is the, the one I described is the initial study, but it also reproduced in many, many subsequent case series. And in this scoping review, and in particular, these two studies, they are from India, this, they, they both actually trying to look at one thing. They do the block and turn the patient and just see whether a patient have pain, look at the pain score, but also one of the category of this is patient have no pain and turn on themselves. In general, when you do this, you have a much, much higher chance that you can do it on yourself. And, and remember the typical trick is we usually give them some drugs to uh, like purple for just turn them. And they are just amazing. Now, but that is only for the control of the hip fracture before the surgery. What about post-surgical pain? This is an Australian, stu Australian study. It's quite interesting. They compare the pain block with a femoral nerve block. Okay, the femoral nerve block. And I would say it's a pragmatic trial. So why is it a pragmatic trial? Because they, the authors just led the anesthesiologists um, choose whatever the anesthetic technique. The only difference is femoral nerve block and pain block. So they can have fractures like intracapsular, extracapsular. They can have different types of surgeries. They can have general spinal. They even can have intrafecal morphine or not. The key is none of them are significantly different from the other. And the result is um, the first four hours, they have a significant difference in terms of the pain. Uh, they did not find any difference after this. So the first four hours, the pain score is substantial. Uh, you can see here, uh, around two thirds of them, they are pain-free. And here with the femoral nerve block, only one third of them, they are pain-free. Uh, but interestingly, the amount of our cultures of weakness. So, you expect the femoral nerve blocks they suffer have a cultural cultural sub weakness, and, and thanks God they do, <laughs> they do. So none of them have intact cultural sub muscle function. But then there is also two of the out of 30, they have a complete absence of cultural sub weakness. So you can see that is some motor block, but I'm gonna comment on this in a moment. The blocking uh, give a prolonged advantage because actually it's, uh, by day one, there's no difference. A lot of uh, criticism for this study is actually you cannot, you cannot just use pain block for any type of surgery, any type of block, any type of uh, uh, fracture. So what they have done is we know that those uh, subtrochanteric uh, or trochanteric, they, they usually have a dynamic hip screw or intramedullary now. They go back to do their post hoc analysis. What they find is if you actually look at this group of surgery, 
The pen block and fermionaf block, they have no difference because pen block cannot actually contribute much. But if you look at those for hip, total hip and, and hemi of opacity, the pen block still have a much higher advantage over the fermionaf block, which makes sense. What about the other hip surgery? Um, the total hip of opacity. So there are two uh, randomized trials, uh, but I just want to focus on this one. So this is the trial that uh, is a randomized controlled trial. Um, the Italian group have a very interesting design. They, uh, all, all the approach is posterior approach, by the way. They have very aggressive pre-op medication to give intravenous axinominophen, desimavazone, and ketororac before the surgery. All of them have spinal, and, and they do the pain box after the spinal. But the control group, they instead of just since they have a spinal, I, I think they should just simply just put the needle there as a sham block. They just the control is have no block, just no block. So it introduces a certain bias. At the end, the surgeon infiltrate, but they infiltrate the skin, the soft tissue, but not the dead capsule. So post up, they have IV ketorolac and IV axinominophen. Wow, this is something that our center cannot afford to have those. And everyone have a PC sublingual, sublingual sufanta. And this is the result. A pain score differences are significant over the first two days. And obviously, they, the difference is much more dramatic in the first 12 hours, start to fail a little bit, but they, still, they, they claim they still can find the differences between uh, 12 to 48 hours. And in terms of energy the consumption, they use sublingual PCA sufanta. And again, they can find uh, differences uh, between the two. And, and it's quite significant between the two doses, whereas uh, two tablets to uh, five tablets over 48 hours. They also find some uh, improvement in the functional function. In general, the, um, the, the one in the pan group, they, they have a much better range of movement, 60 something degree compared with 38 degree. And also they start to walk. 10 hours, 10 hours earlier. So this is actually very significant. So uh, I, I think actually to summarize, there's no doubt that pain block is a, is, a, is, a, is a block designed to block the pain from the hip fracture. So it's a very, very good way to block the pain from the hip fracture. But in terms of operative energy of a hip fracture, they still find it superior to the femoral nerve block. In terms of total heat of plasty, even, even with a posterior approach, there's, there's evidence to support the use of this. And there is a low, not no, and no, but low ROW, low incidence of a motor block, which I'm going to address in a moment. Why have a motor block? Let's just pause for a moment. Why on earth we have a motor block? The target is deep to the muscle, deep to the psoas muscle between AIIS and inupipid eminence. And the femoral nerve is like transatlantic. You have the whole piece of muscle, not a skinny fascia, whole piece of muscle that blocks you from the nerve. Why on earth you have the cordial subvenous? And on the middle side, the optimal nerve, you have an extension of the uh, fascia trans uh, transversalis coming down all the way and prevent you, fascia ilica, sorry, are coming down all the way to prevent you to spread to the main trunk. And this is quite a tough uh, fascia, so you shouldn't block the alternator. The, the, but as I say, the articular branches able to go through the fascia and supply the inferior part of the capsule. That is a different issue. So there are three possibilities that you can get a motor block. One is intramuscular, and I think most of the time it's intramuscular. So when you actually inject transient in the muscle, uh, for those who practice regional anesthesia, you know the magic or the secret of regional anesthesia. If you put 20 cc somewhere close to the nerve, you will get to the nerve. And this is actually what happened. So this is actually a get, uh, if you inject in the muscle, there's a chance that you can spread to the femoral nerve. The other possibility is you, you are putting two medial and, and, to, uh, and inject with a high volume. Some of the pain block literature, they put 30 cc. The fascia junction between the patinus and the, and the psoas are not perfect. You can actually break through this one and spread and retrograde and go back all the way to the femoral nerve. And the third actually is that you can go the other way, and, but this probably 
help you to block the larger fibro cutaneous, but not the uh, uh, the, the, the motor nerve. So so why muscle injection can cause the block? So so why or why happen? Well, I'm pretty sure a lot of people who perform pain block and say I don't, I don't, I don't inject in the muscle. I'm pretty sure I, I inject deep to the muscle. So l let's talk about uh, the, uh, what happened. I think everyone who have done anyone who have done regional anesthesia on the ultrasound, you know that when you puff through the fascia. The fascia don't just pop when you touch it. You indent. Let me say that again. You indent the fascia before you puff through this. Depends on the toughness. Um, sometimes you just indent a little bit and puff through. And sometimes we see a young patient, you indent probably for one to two centimeters before you can puff through the fascia. Now, in the pain block, you have the psoas fascia rest on the bone. And there's no chance you can, you can indent the fascia. You really rely on your brutal force, or I would say the best way to get through the fascia is to put some pressure and rotate a needle, simulating a, a piercing function, and you can get through. But if you're not careful, you may not do, uh, puncture through the fascia. Okay, sometimes you, you, you don't using my uh, rotation movement, you keep, keep on pushing very hard. And then the next thing is you puff through all the way and jam into this thick we call iliofemoral ligament. And then the next thing you notice, well, you, you put a lot of pressure, but you cannot inject because you are jammed inside the iliofemoral ligament. What you have to do is gently pull back, pull back slowly, slowly, so that you are just at the fascial plane between the iliofemoral ligament and the psoas fascia, and you see the fascial lift. If not, you can just see most of the uh, local anesthetic inject around the muscle. So just want to show you this is a a lateral medial, so you put the needle there, you see the local anesthetics lift the psoas fascia. And, and this is actually is a picture that uh, coming from one of the very senior faculty at our site, and he published a lot, well, he, 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 he talked about a lot about pain block, and see what happened. So this is a needle, psoas, and you can see here in chat, he showed that it's very nice, very nice, and uh, this is a psoas fascia, and eventually you can see some local anesthetic around here, so job done. Hooray. Well, I want to replay this video again, but not to look at this. Look at here. Look at here. Look at here. So actually, this is only 3cc. Look at here. You can see the local anesthetic into the muscle at 3cc. Imagine you inject more, and if someone have a very thin muscle, you can easily go to um, the femoral nerve. So it depends on the technique and also how thin the psoas muscle. So in conclusion, I present to you uh, some of the target pain generator that you should pay attention for the hip analgesia, um, how I develop the pain block, and what is the scientific basis for the pain block and the clinical evidence, and to discuss with you and share some experience with you about the pearls on the motor block. With this in mind, thank you very much for your attention. That is my, uh, the social not my only social media, um, and wish you all have a, a pain day. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Peng, for this uh, wonderful presentation. I'm sure you have um, clarified many of the queries that uh, folks have had. And I think there are also many unanswered questions. Hopefully this will make them think. So I think a good presentation is always when you raise more questions than you give answers to. Okay, with this um, words, Professor Peng will be coming back for the Q&A. Uh, it's my great pleasure now to welcome uh, Tony Ng, uh, I, as I introduced to you, to you before, uh, don't get fooled by this young and uh, handsome look of his. He has quite a mature head on top of his shoulder. And as uh, Professor Peng also alluded to, they're doing some wonderful work relating to delivery of pain in a group of patients where they may have languished in bed and may have died a slow death. Today, to be able to do uh, to provide them care, even in those that are not being operated on, is a, is, a, is a great service to humanity. And it makes my life much easier when I uh, make a decision sometimes when we are consulted about uh, patients in a POAC, when I say that this patient is not suitable for 
any anesthesia, then we always <laughs> refer them to the our chronic pain service because we now know that they can still live a reasonably good quality of life. Uh, so without further ado, um, Tony, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you for the um, kind introduction from Professor Kamaka and also thank you for your invitation to this uh, very nice uh, um, webinar. Um, for me to share my um, humble experience on um, the a very minority group of patients um, who cannot go for surgery. Um, I actually want to, want Chris to look at this picture because uh, this is uh, one of the, my favorite places for me to have cycling actually. So if I have um, a chance, I would really want to invite him to Hong Kong to have a ride in this uh, um, um, lies the landscape. So um, here we go. So this is my disclosures night. And concerning my scope of my talk, I will talk about the indications um, in the context of uh, hip fracture. And I will also try to tell um, our story and journey to develop different approaches of uh, um, hip neuralizers um, in the setting of hip fracture. And lastly, I would also like to tell some clinical pros and also practical tips and our outcomes so far. So the clear indications for chemical hemolysis, uh, chemical uh, neuralysis in operal hip fracture as stated in the title and topic. Nevertheless, just uh, want to let you know, um, there are some other good indications that may be eligible to this uh, um, technique, um, which would include those uh, advanced um, osteoarthritis of hip, um, no matter they are too old for the surgery or too ill for the surgery or, or the waiting time is too long and then, and then um, the pain cannot be controlled um, conservatively. Or else in those uh, cancer pain patients um, on those high dose opioid with radiotherapy maximized and the patient still yell, um, cannot be ambulate, cannot um, come out of the bed, and you can still consider this. So why hip neuralizers in the fracture um, hip here? So usually our cases are those uh, um, with too high surgery, uh, too high risk for surgery or too ill for surgery. Or sometimes now, because this is, this is a standard option in our locality, um, during the discussion between surgeons and um, relatives and patients, and when the patient is too old, demented, even without any acute medical insult, sometimes the, pair, the relatives of the patient still don't want to go for um, an open surgery for fixing the fracture. And that's why they will go for the um, hip neuralizer sometimes. And when you try to treat this group of patients, so think about this, our end point is we really need to relieve the incident pain because this is the most challenging pain we would like to handle. So that would refer to um, turning the patient to change the pampers, um, um, asking the patient to come out of the bed and sit. And this is really challenging most of the time without any um, good energies here. And, and in those cancer cases, cancer cases, we would like to reduce the opioid consumption as well. And, and one of the very important thing here, um, um, which is different from um, surgery or the regional block for surgery is um, we really need to consider something that is free from motor and sensory blocks, low, low incident, but free from it because this is very important. Because now we're injecting some neurolytic agent, but not anesthetics. So this is a very important consideration for us. So let's think about those uh, old ways that we have all along, including those trash like this um, by the orthopedic surgeon on the wall. Of course it works. Everybody knows it works, but, but then the patient have to stay here for three weeks. Then how can the surgeons discharge the patients? And even we don't mention about this logistic problem with the patients um, become bedridden for weeks. Most of the patients, not most, but quite a few of patients may develop other complications like um, pneumonia, which is not that good. Or energy here, well, um, 
I, I guess most of you, if you have the clinical experience, you know that no matter how much uh, oral energy that you would give, you, you cannot really um, um, handle the movement thing quite well unless you give some strong opioid. But don't forget this. Uh, this is a group of frail patients. If you give those strong opioid, many of them basically cannot tolerate um, the side effect opioid. And, and the movement thing is quite a breakthrough and incident shock acting fast on set. So unless you have a really good opioid that can um, synchronize of all these stimulations, otherwise basically you cannot um, match the stimulation there. And you would keep long acting opioid. So um, when the patient is um, resting comfortably on the bed, the opioid side effect would be too much. Um, intralacial fentanyl, fentanyl, it would be a possibility to handle this problem, but um, basically it's licensed for cancer pain only. So this is uh, not so good. Okay. Um, when I was still a registrar, I learned that I will use some capital like family love capital or the capital that Chris just mentioned is the fascia I like his block. Um, of course it works. Um, and in fact, we are doing this as well, especially for those um, who require surgery, but still need to wait for say one week or two weeks more um, um, so that the some basic um, a medical problem can be fixed or optimized or when the patient is put on some anticoagulant because some cardiac stent, um, you still need to wait for one or two weeks more before um, the, the, the total cost of uh, uh, anticoagulant or antiplatelet is completed. For those cases, we still give a capital with continuous infusion and it works really well. But in the setting of those who are not going to do surgery, if you put in a head capital again, so how can we discharge the patient home? So this is the biggest issue in our um, locality. I know that in some countries they have a portable pump and then you can have a really, really strong community nurse who can take care of all those capital and pump. That would be really um, good. But um, I actually, I'm quite am envious for those countries or places who um, can offer this type of um, service. But in Hong Kong, this is basically impossible. So capital um, option is out for this setting as well. Okay, so, um, and then we talk about why chemical approach. Some people would um, argue why not doing some radio frequency, um, which may um, be more long lasting um, theoretically compared with a chemical um, approach. So there's a several reason for us to use a chemical approach because one, one of the reasons is we do most of our cases in broad room or in our PACU. Um, a PACU, a PACU is uh, in our hospital, is a hybrid between broad room and, and um, recovery area. And we, we sometimes do our epidural there as well. And, and that's why we don't have those radio frequency facility in, in the PACU. And another thing is, remember that this is a group of patients who, um, I have uh, multiple comorbidities and many of them are demented and with some cognitive uh, dysfunction. So how can they communicate with you well for the motor and sensory testing? So this is a big question for me. And, and comparatively, if you um, heard from other lectures or read about the um, literature, if you do a radio frequency, you basically need to have a stack lesion. That means to have the multiple lesions along those uh, um, target nerves that we, Professor Penn, just talked about. So it's very time consuming. And, and of course, um, um, radio frequency is quite expensive. Just a little, it can cost about several hundred dollars or even $1,000, which is uh, much more expensive than a simple spinal needle or a broad needle. And even with my Neolithic agent, which is also um, cheaper than the radio frequency. And although we, you may argue the duration of action of the um, chemical ablation would be shorter compared with radio frequency, but think about this. Um, most of the fracture will heal by three to six months, right? Um, and, and 
if you know about the duration of action of alcohol well, most of the most of them also work for few months. So so can you imagine this? The actually the duration of action of alcohol or even phenol can match really well to the um, healing process of fracture. So that's why it's a good choice in this contest. And when we come to those uh, case selection here, so we need to um, check about, um, first of all, the type of fracture. I, I, I heard from Professor Penn's talk, he talked about those different types of hip fracture. This is a really important consideration here because if you talk about those hip fracture, which is actually the proximal shaft of femur, um, which is too far away from the hip capsule. So sorry, the um, hip neurolysis may not be a good choice in this type of hip fracture. But if you talk about the intertrochanteric fracture or lack of femur or head of femur, yes, they are good cases. And another thing we need to assess is the pain intensity on movement. Um, Sometimes without um, a, very, a, a very good reason to explain, some of the patients even they have a, um, a very um, clear fracture there. The patient um, doesn't feel any um, significant pain. Even you try to move or rotate or even rock the, the hip joint. Um, some of them can be explained by a very small crack fracture, but we, we do really see some patients who uh, have a very displaced um, fracture but then the patient still at most um, just complain of a mild pain only. So for those cases, we need to balance between the risk and benefit. And for those cases, we may not offer a um, um, hip neurolysis for those patients because there's still some risk that we'll mention later. And, and before you consider chemical relation here, we also need to consider other the patient comorbidities. For example, the heart failure, whether the ejection fraction is too bad, um, any reason to take arrhythmia, remember if you, you give if you give alcohol, the patient will have some alcohol absorption and will result in um, sinus tachycardia, and which may actually trigger another episode of atrial fibrillation or SVT. Um, advanced dementia, um, the patient may become even more drunk. Um, for those with pacemaker and ICD, of course, they're not a good choice for radio frequency. So chemical ablation would be a good one. And we also need to consider those a liver renal impairment as well. Some people will ask me, um, um, especially from those overseas, whether you would do a fluoroscopy guided or a cuff approach. For those who don't know what cuff approach refers to, it means the combined ultrasound and fluoroscopy approach. So um, it really depends uh, on your experience and your facility availability. So the pros of using a fluoroscopy is you have a dual modality confirmation. So it also allows you to have, to see the contrast spread um, um, before you inject your lutetic agent in advance. So which is a good thing, but then you, you, it takes more time. And, and basically if you just do a fluoroscopy guided procedure, you cannot visualize all the soft tissue and there's a, um, multiple studies in the early 2010 show the fluoroscopy guided um, articular branch um, injection for those pain patients. It works, but the but the effect size is not that strong compared with the ultrasound guided. So what I was what I would say is you have if you have the X-ray you have uh, you can still use it, but I would not recommend a fluoroscopy guided only. A procedure for this uh, neurolytic procedure. So, um, so in our center, we actually use ultrasound guided approach only because I just mentioned to you, we do almost all our cases in the PACU or in the broad rooms. So one of the approaches um, um, we have developed so far. Now, this is our first case report uh, reported by our colleague, Dr. Sasaki. And, and we actually did this in 2015 or 16, okay? And then we spent some time to validate and also write up the case report. And also, of course, Professor Penn also um, supported us in, in 
in this uh, case report as well. The idea is we try to find about the peri, uh, the particular branch by thinking about those uh, peri capsular targets. So, and also we try to adopt the Hilton's law. For those who don't know Hilton's law, it suggests that any nerve serving a muscle that produces movement at a joint also innervates the joint itself and the skin over the joint. So if we know that the muscle here is innervated by the femoral nerve, then there must be a um, somewhere a femoral nerve articular branch somewhere underneath this muscle before it, it enters the hip capsule. The same for the obturator nerve as well. So our very initial approach is to uh, is kind of infiltration by infiltrating a large volume of uh, local anesthetic followed by um, alcohol and try to infiltrate this, uh, what we call now is the ileal psoas um, praying here um, to block the um, articular branch of femoral nerve. And this is the contra spread. And this which is quite similar to those, uh, to the um, fluoroscopy picture just shared by Professor Ben in the last talk. And another one is um, from medial to lateral to the um, underneath the patinous, and people now call it a subpatineal prey. And we also inject another volume here. And the um, spread of contrast is also correlated with the, um, um, the what we call it, the inverted fast, uh, a lot of the, the, the um, inverted teardrop, teardrop um, side in the fluoroscopy approach. So, so this is the, after we we um, do this. Um, the Danish group actually um, proposed something to support us um, in terms of the um, Inosoa spring block. They invite um, twenty patients to volunteer to inject some um, LA and also some MLI contrast, and then they inject to the same spring here, and then you see most of the um, contra spread will be limited by ilosoas tendon and basically they will spread around this um, um, ilosoas print that block the um, femoral um, articular branch as well as the accessory obturator nerve. And then another study from the same group of researchers in from Denmark. This time they, they, they tried to use the cadaver to validate the subpatineal um, approach, um, this a patinal ingestion. Again, they use 15 mil here, methane brew, and they found that apart from the articular branch, it also um, brought the um, uh, main branch of uh, obturator nerve as well. So this gave us some additional information that, oh, this uh, approach, although it worked really well to brought the articular branch, but it may have a chance that it will affect the um, 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 motor branch of the obturator nerve as well. And that's why um, another thing is for this infiltrative approach, because we give a um, big volume of uh, alcohol, most of the patient become so drunk. Many of them uh, were very sleepy afterwards. So after we did two to three cases, we modify our approach and we also got an opportunity to discuss with the Toronto group, of course, uh, led by Professor Penn. And we modify our approach. And, and we have a journey that we use the Penn broad approach plus the obturator nerve articular branch approach, but we use a much lower volume. But then right now at the moment, we actually combine all these three approaches all together. So why? Because for the PEMBRO, we can handle the femoral articular branch, high branches, and an accessory obturator nerve. And the, we still do the ileosoas spring block uh, infiltration, but use a much lower volume. Our aim is to cover the low branches of femoral nerve articular branch. And for the obturator nerve articular branch, it really depends on the patient's position. And I will elaborate later. We will do the classical oblique approach or we develop a statutory approach as well. So just to recap the pen broad approach. 
So this is uh, just using a curve or a linear leader, a linear probe depends on the body build of the patient and then you use a lateral to medial um, trajectory and then you inject a low volume of Logan is, uh, Logan is We use in our um, hospital, we use four to five mil or if sometimes even three mil of Logan is So we really mandate us to have a really good lift, lifting of the um, um, ilosoas fascia. Um, so that we, even if we use a very low volume of local extractor, you can still block these um, um, articular branch well. And then we follow with, uh, followed by the same volume of the alcohol, uh, absolute alcohol injection in the ratio of one to one. And for the optimal alert, the initial approach is the classical approach. We move down from here, after we visualize the head and leg of the femur, and then we move down until we visualize the inferior um, inferomedial acetabulum where the femoral head will disappear. And then we inject one to two cc, two cc of uh, local anesthetic followed by the same amount of absolute alcohol. But um, for those who have done enough cases of uh, um, hip liberalizers, you will encounter that real life is not so simple and easy. So for example, this is a, a case that I did last week or this week. You can see the um, AIIS here. There's a, some, a lot of um, um, osteophyte here. So you basically see double shadow here. Even you, if you move down the probe a little bit, quarterly, you are, it's already the, the head capsule. So, so you can also see there's a lot of uh, bony irregularity here. So this would um, give you some challenge that you may not faithfully um, um, inject your local anesthetic or alcohol or other little agent um, evenly enough along this um, what we call pen print. So we cannot guarantee this. Another thing is this is the hip capsule or the ideal source spring, this is the um, um, hematoma. We have some real cases that the fracture was too bad that when you try to move the probe um, quarterly to look around the capsule that um, the Danish group demonstrated in the cadaver study or the, the volunteer study, basically it, it doesn't work because there's a lot of a destruction of the um, um, capsule as well as hematoma sometimes. So, so can, how can you identify the capsule clearly here? So you, again, is another challenge. Lastly, for those who did the operator alert block, I also heard from our local um, administrators, also pain physician to feedback to me that they quite often encountered this problem because um, many of time the patient um, hip is external rotated when they have a hip fracture. This is most of the time is their lateral position. And when you look at here, the femoral vessel will actually be twisted laterally and also deviated laterally. So you cannot see the, the a very oval shape of femoral vessel here. Instead, it twisted here. And this is actually the trajectory of your Lead towards the IMA. So this gives a big challenge for us to perform the ONAB um, neuralysis and block. So how do we handle this? So think about when we talk about the ultrasound, this is a 2D image. If we turn the probe from here to 45 degrees, so that you say in a longitudinal way, and, and then we shift the probe medial to lateral um, very slightly and meticulously, meticulously until we see this image. So this is an under view of the inferior uh, inframedial acetabulum, and this is also the patinous. And um, very surprisingly, sometimes you can see some honeycomb shaped um, nerves here, which would correlate the correlate correlate with the um, optical nerve articular branch that. Um, 
um, Professor Pan just talked about in the Kadhafi finding in the last talk. So that would suggest that this, this um, approach, you may visualize the nerve. And secondly, you can basically avoid the vessels. When you shift the nerve to, um, a little bit laterally, you can see the whole vessels here so that you can really avoid it. And, and because the little trajectory is from caudal to cephalic, so theoretically, your little target is more close to this particular branch. You can, you can see the, the, the nerve, you can basically just put the little here and inject the, you're injected directly to the nerve as well. And, and think about another consideration is when the, if there's a femoral head or femoral leg fracture, the, the, if, the, if the degree of fracture or the disruption is too severe, basically you cannot identify any femoral head here. So it would be of some challenge for you to identify the IMA clearly because you don't have a femoral head for you as a guide. But if you use the statutory approach, you basically avoid this problem. So this is the beauty of this approach. Um, but my practical tip is, um, um, I, I would say 90% of the patient, nowadays I would use this statutory approach to target the ONAB just like this patient. Um, however, very occasionally we still encounter patients who have a hip fracture in this position. I had a case I did this week is in this position. So you have no way to, to target the pubic groin or the, the femoral groin area in that situation. What you can do, you still need to go for the classical ovary approach um, to target the ONAB. So this is the, some ultrasound scan of the world patient to see how I do our um, anterior hip neuralizers nowadays. So this is the first injection to the pen brain. And then we move down the probe a little bit to the um, ideal source spring here, and then inject local anesthetic, about three wheel of local inject local anesthetics, followed by the same volume of alcohol here. And then we go for the statutory approach of the, um, um, to tackle the uh, uh, obturator articular branch here by injecting one to 1.5 cc of lo local anesthetic followed by the same volume of alcohol. So this is the schematic diagram of how I do um, for the, um, these uh, few uh, injections here. So um, I skip this because Professor Penn has uh, mentioned this already. Um, this one um, basically is more related to anesthetics, but for pain or uh, neurolytic procedure, we seldom um, use such a big volume um, because we know that they will go through, um, open up all the fascial prank channel and go up to the motor branch. And that's why we use the lowest volume possible so that we hope to keep all the neurolytics or agent just along this prank. So the magic cup of sofa is 20 mil. So remember this number, don't give anything more than this number. So how about the outcomes? So this is our um, case series that published in 2020. And actually the cases we recruited um, were from 2017. And basically the most striking result here is um, we found that half of the patient could sit out within five days um, after the neuralizers and, and more than half of them can be discharged um, home up or, or to the OH home. Um, within two weeks. And very, very amazingly, three of them could actually walk with stake um, during our long-term follow-up in the orthopedic clinic. And um, now this is one of the patients who consented me to share um, his video and photos here. So we tried to, this is from day five after the um, uh, neurolysis. And these are our pain nurses. Now when you try to press um, the hip, when you look at the patient's um, face, patient, she actually felt quite comfortable. And, and then we try to gently rotate, externally rotate and also internally rotate um, her hip. 
you can see her face is also quite comfortable as well. She actually reported that very mild pain while we try to um, rotate um, the hip here, but low pain when flexed the hip. And, and finally, we, we, simulate, we simulated the usual nursing care to change their um, diaper. So the patient didn't yell. If you don't liberalize this, patient usually yell and very loud in the ward. And, and even the, health, the, the, the ward care um, staff basically didn't have other way to handle this, this kind of pain. You can also see she could sit very comfortably on a chair. And this is actually what our orthopedic surgeons want to see because without the, with this, it can largely reduce uh, a lot of uh, complication as a result of long-term bedridden status and, and basically can send her home. So, but then, um, as I said, real life is not so simple. So, um, when we do enough cases, we have uh, something, some kind of some cases that no matter how good we do for the anterior neuralizers for those three targets, some patients still yell. Um, and don't forget this group of patients, quite a few of them are demented. And even you still have a little bit pain um, residually, they will still yell and scream whenever you touch them and turn them. So when we encounter this, we need to look for this uh, as a differential diagnosis. First of all, whether it's your technical problems, as mentioned by Professor Penn, an intramuscular ingestion is a very common mistake. And whether your um, fracture is too displaced, um, that it distorted your capsule too much or impinge on some soft tissue. And whether you pick a wrong case for hip neuralysis, which is actually a femoral shaft fracture instead of the hip joint fracture. And, and um, I also encountered a few cases, okay, that the patient yelled, um, but then when we check where we meticulous, meticulously, is the pain from the OA knee and also the contracture, but not from the hip. And lastly, we need to check whether there's any other soft tissue injury like hematoma, tendon rupture, muscle tear, which can also contribute to significant pain. Um, and, but what else can attribute to this pain here? So I, I, I believe that Chris and also Popan has, uh, have mentioned this uh, posterior hip capsule innovation. Um, actually, this is the first study who illustrated the significance of posterior hip uh, capsule innovations. This is from French, from the, from the French group. Um, although we know that most of the nociceptor concentrate to the anterior um, um, articular branches, um, Pierre and his group found that um, under certain situations, the nociceptor density is still the highest over here among all these posterior articular branch especially those that love from the to the QF and also the superior cutial love and no side love. So our question is, um, how do we target this if we have this piece of uh, new information? So should we target these uh, superior cutial love here, but then you will also block the, um, and you will realize the um, a motor branch of superior cutial love and resulting in gluteus muscle atrophy. And how about this love to quadratus femoris? The same rationale here. First of all, it's too close to the sciatic nerve. It's a, there's a high risk for you to puncture the sciatic nerve. And at the same time, there's still a motor branch that innervate the quadratus femoris here as well. So this day are not a good choice. So our concept of pericapsular innervation can actually be applied to everywhere. Now you talk about knee and shoulder. And here we think about this. So from the diagram, you see almost all the posterior articular branch um, enter the joint over around this superlateral um, aspect of the posterior hip. So would it be a good target for us to, to um, 
um, anesthetize or, or to lyse the posterior hip capsule. So um, let's see um, another discussion here. So people would say um, the anterior capsule contribute to say 90% or even 95% of the um, um, low C-section. And then although the last of the, say the um, posterior capsule still have some low C-section, but then you may say five to 10% at most, but how come in the reality, even I brought my anterior um, articular branch perfectly, the patient still yell and the pain doesn't, um, 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 reduce significantly. So think about this, apart from the um, reason mentioned by Propan um, in the last talk, another reason for us to think about is the capsular distortion. Um, remember when there's uh, some fracture here, just like this CT scan, you see the whole geometry of the, the joint is um, distorted. So when you think about um, um, this, even without the um, sensitization of those silent receptor. Just the distortion of the capsule can also give you quite a lot of discomfort. Um, so that would be another reason to explain why um, it, the posterior capsule can hurt so much when there's a combination of factors, when there's a hematoma, inflammation, distortion of the capsule, all these can contribute to, to the final low C-section. And that's why we try to do this um, as a PHPN, um, and, and we try to locate this because there's a many way to target the superlateral part of a posterior hip capsule, but um, one of the reasons we use this approach and use the piriform as a, as a guide because it's easily um, um, found. Um, it can be reproducible um, by um, many patients. Uh, many, many physicians, and it seems to be a easier technique compared with other approaches. And then we also use a medial to lateral trajectory so that most of the injectate is going laterally is instead of going medially so that um, the chance of involving the sciatic nerve will be minimized. And then we also use a very low volume, just one view. We see a little bit of uh, um, looking acetic or alcohol just spread underneath the piriformis and then we stop. And then these are the results. We started to perform this technique in mid 2019. And then we gathered the result till the first quarter of the 2021. And then um, we did try 70 cases there. Actually, we should do more, but because of COVID, we did less. And 70 patients respond, responded quite well to the original anterior hip neurolysis um, to the anterior free branches. And, but then we have around 30% of patients who didn't respond quite well. And then we add the PHPN to these 30% uh, percent of patients. And then where we um, uh, are presently, we um, so most of the patients responded quite well after adding the posterior hip um, per, uh, uh, capsule um, neurolysis here. But you still got few patients who still didn't respond quite well. But then this also gives us a um, information that um, the combination of anterior and also po posterior capsule um, can complete the pain generator in most of the patients. And after the neurolysis, as a clinician, um, we often um, focus on our post-operative surveillance and especially for this group of frail patients. So we need to assess the patient um, on pain and also functional aspect, but then we also need to look for any potential complications. For example, any groin hematoma, the most risky part is the video file of uh, medial five because there's a acetabular um, branch of obturator artery just underneath the um, um, ONAB. And that's why there's a risk that you may puncture these small valves. And remember that more many, many of the patients here, um, 
the soft tissue over the medial fine are quite less. And basically the hematoma can be um, collected without low tissue there. So that's something for us. Um, we, it's our routine to, to look for the ground hematoma after every neurologist case of our pain nurse um, on post of day one. Another thing is the hemodynamic instability. There will be two potential causes for this. One is the alcohol, um, because the absorption of alcohol, especially if you have some um, um, hematoma there that you are unnoticed, or there's a, some capillaries that you are unnoticed, and then you still inject your alcohol there, then the absorption will be quite fast. And then there will be some um, development of groin hematoma as well. And the risk would actually be more if your injectee is more than 10 mil. So um, it doesn't mean that after 10 mil, your, all these things would ha uh, must happen, but just be cautious when you inject more than 10 mil of um, al absolute alcohol. Um, in those susceptible cases, we will give a cardiac monitoring for a few hours to one day to make sure the low tachyarrhythmia there. And, and according to our experience, most of the patient um, would become stable, okay, after a few hours. And the next question after this uh, newly um, published article is, um, do we still need a diagnostic block um, in the setting of inoperable hip fracture? Given that now we know that 70% or even 80% of patients would respond well, okay, um, to our um, neurolytic technique. Now, um, this is just my fault, okay? And um, basically, if you still, your, your, your facility or your hospital just have absolute alcohol, so you, you're gonna give a local anesthetic anyway before your alcohol ingestion. So um, you can use this um, to serve as a diagnostic block um, to wait for 10 minutes and then uh, 10 to 15 minutes and then you try to move the patient so that you know your broad work works well and then you give your your alcohol alcohol or uh, to liberalize the patient but um, what I would say is we probably don't need to send the patient um, to have two separate sessions between the diagnostic block and neurolytic block given that these patients um, are frail and it's also quite cumbersome to send a patient twice and you know that the successful rate is also quite high now so that um, probably you just need one session for that so if you have pheno here in your uh, locality in fact in my hospital i'm trying to introduce pheno to replace alcohol in this particular contest because we know that the successful rate is 70 to 80 percent now so basically we may just give the diagnostic block directly and give the pheno um, in a sense that it could also give some comfort to patient without the burn sensation. And, and if you really use phenol, possibly aqueous space would be better because the spread would be better. So, um, and another setting, hip joint, bone metastasis, probably you don't require dialogue for as well. Um, but for OA hip, it's a bit tricky. And I would say uh, we, we, probably, we probably still need one. And lastly, I would like to talk about the um, future role of hip neurolysis. So right now, um, we what we got it, this uh, technique or treatment modality is palliative. Surgical fixation is still the first choice whenever first choice whenever possible. But in fact, we are now working with our orthopedic surgeons to analyze our long term results to around five years and see any survival benefit in any subset of the patient. For example, for those uh, with acute medical insults, say ACS or CVA, acute stroke, or acute COPD attack, whether there are any survival benefit, or there's another group of patients, they are um, some chronic illness, they are quite advanced, but quite stable, like end-stage renal failure, go stage three COPD without any attack, or um, New York Heart Association class three or four heart failure patients. So, so we are, we are trying to um, analyze our result and see where the survival benefit there. So future directions, um, 
we need to explore the optimal volume of our dual license technique, especially for the PHPN, because it's a relatively new one. And we understand that our case node is um, locked enough. Okay, we just did 20 cases from the study period. We definitely need a RCT for further validation as well. We hope we can try to look for any survival, survival benefits, okay? And finally, with further information to evolve in the future, we hope to work out a, a best practice for treatment choice in fragility fracturing long-term. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tony. That was uh, very well put. Uh, I quite appreciate the way you have gone through the analyzing the problem and finding a solution. I hope the participants will take away the message that there is help available in this very difficult group of patients. Uh, and I have no doubt when you eventually put your data together, I'm sure you will find that there is a survival benefit. Okay, now I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Peng and uh, Tony uh, to address some of the questions that have been, been coming fast and furious. We are also running a little bit behind schedule, but maybe we can leave 15 minutes for the discussion. Okay, Christine, over to you. And so the first question is directed to both Professor Peng and also Dr. Ng. So it's from Dr. Zhen Zhen. So consider the versatility uh, of the pen block. Would you uh, to encourage pen block to be incorporated as part of the enhanced recovery program in all hip fractures patients? Um, for me, I well, it really depends on the, the facilities, what you have and the resource you have. For me, I think it makes sense. So think about this. So I, I don't know in Asia, but in typically in North America, so someone who have a hip fracture, they go to the eMERGE. And then so it's typical in North America because of some mandate because of the mortality data. Um, the hospital are obliged to operate within two days, uh, no more than three days, but optimal within two days. So what will happen is in the eMERGE, uh, typically, now, we, once they are in, in an immersion, they activate their pink surface. So the pink surface will go down. And while they are waiting for the surgery, um, they, have, they usually receive a lot of IV hydromorphone or morphine. And then they make them drowsy, they may aspirate while waiting for surgery. So typically they activate active pink surface, go there. So they call us, the regional team, and do the, uh, uh, the, the block, uh, mostly pink, pink block. And so that they can start to turn or even sit up a little bit so that they when they drink, they don't aspirate. So, and, and then they will have a surgery within the next uh, 24 hours or so. This pathway will be, for humane reason, is more, most humane. For mortality, and we don't have a mortality data, but at least they can uh, sit up a little bit so that they don't choke and aspirate. And, and so that and they don't need to be drugged up with all the IV morphine before the surgery. So it makes a lot of sense. Now, this is a pathway that uh, our hospital are working and we want to look at the data. Uh, but this is actually, I, I think it's very uh, reasonable for, uh, in the system in North America, but I, I, I don't know enough about in Asia. So yes, the answer is yes. Um, yeah, thank you, um, Popen. Um, I fully agree with Popen. Um, in Hong Kong, so I know the situation more clearly here. So I, I think nowadays our emergency physicians are, are also quite enthusiastic in learning some ultrasound technique. So in terms of the um, enhanced recovery program, we, we actually um, hope that in future, um, some emergency physician can actually do this block because pen block is quite um, simple without too much risk. And um, the landmark is quite clear and reproduci reproducible. So they can give an injection and then we can do the surgery within um, 48 hours. And post-operatively, my thought is, um, although we can still adopt multimodal energies here in this group of patients, but think about their comorbidities. Many of them are frail, not to mention about opioid, but even NSAID, um, say 90 year or 100 year old, they go for surgery. Um, even you can still prescribe NSAID what you can give is just a low dose, but not a high dose. Um, Panadol, some of them would be also conservative, not to give four gram, but just three gram per day. 
So with this combination of multimodal analgesia and with a bone surgery, okay, there are a lot of drilling and trimming of the bone cortex and actually quite painful. Um, um, and that's why with the incorporation of this uh, pen block, um, I think that will have a lot of help in this group of patients. But again, um, um, that would require some um, education to our initiatives in Hong Kong um, so that they have this uh, technique and also there's a mentality. Okay. I think uh, there is no denying that given the simplicity, it is something that should be incorporated. But given uh, the resource implication, I think this is where the bean counters have to be really put into the fray. Even in North America, I'm sure uh, it does not become a standard of care. Uh, given its simplicity and how uh, much uh, uh, discomfort these patients face, although the mandate is now to operate them within 24 hours, I wish the mandate would say that they should be made pain-free within an hour of their arrival to the operating uh, to the hospital. Uh, yes, you can operate within 24 hours, but as Tony alluded to, uh, when we are in the wards and we are running around doing our other uh, errands, we can often know which is a hip fracture screaming away because they are very typically uh, associated with the movement and care. So I think uh, I think uh, this is a good discussion, and I have uh, no doubt that this is a positive step, and it will it will become reality in the near future. Uh, in um, probably in more developed countries first and then in the in, in the average population. Yes, next, Christine. Okay, so uh, the next question is uh, directed to uh, Dr. Tony Ng. So the audience are quite interested in the neurolysis. So um, um, Dr. Rajendra Sahu would like to have a recap on how much alcohol do you inject for each nerve block? And also, uh, Dr. Mufukuma would like to know, uh, are you worried about uh, absolute alcohol will cause injuries to other uh, surrounding organs, for example, ischemia of the head of femur? Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rajendra. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, and um, to recap, the alcohol ingestion has to be kept as low as possible. Um, the dose we use, the water we use usually is around four to three to five mil for the pen um, um, praying. And then we inject another three mil to the ileosoas praying. And lastly is one to 1.5 mil to the operator left articular branch. We give a local anesthetic first and then, and then we give the same volume of uh, um, absolute echo so that the ratio is around one to one. And then to um, respond to Moda, um, nice to meet you again. Um, and in fact, there's uh, some risks to, for the neurolytic agent that can um, injure the surrounding tissue, like those that uh, if you see the video just shared by Professor Pan um, in, the la in the second talk, you see some injected can actually go retrograde through the little trajectory. And that would actually be the um, location where the ileosoas muscle is located. So if um, um, your injector is too much, the more alcohol that would um, track back to the trajectory, then there's a more chance that there are irritation to the ileosoas. Um, there's a possibility of that. Um, but for the um, irritation to the thermal head, right, Christine? Yes. Irritation. Um, I, I never have encountered any single case of this, unless unless you 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 inject your your injected intraarticularly because you puncture too much um, into the joint instead of pericapsularly, then there will be a risk of uh, um, intraarticular alcohol, and that would cause a fibrosis um, in long run. Can I just add upon so? Um... You know, Tony is a very complicated thinker. So the, the, the step he, he, he has done for each dose is so meticulous. I don't know the, the one who, who cannot understand the dose. Uh, uh, when we submit the journal, the, the viewer cannot understand as well. So <laughs> just go to our APM journal. There is a summary table to, do, to, 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 to list exactly what dose, what volume we use uh, for those. So uh, you'll follow. I think the, 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 the person who asked this question asked about does it jeopardize the muscular supply? Um, many years ago, uh, uh, one, one third of a century ago, I was a surgeon. 
So we know the vascular supply, um, they are they are from the medial lateral uh, collect, uh, uh, circumflex artery and something from the ligament like, terrace. So they are all extra capsular and reflect inside the head and neck. So when he, when we when, when, when we do the pericapsular uh, block for the for those uh, alcohol, the local anesthetic spread along the capsule plane. They will not, if unless you inject a high volume, they may, may not uh, expand all the way to extra capsular, which you would meet the circumflex artery. So in, in general, I would say the, the chemical will not damage the vascular supply unless you inject high water, which we are not advocating. Uh, Christine, since we are running out of time and we are slightly behind schedule, can I say uh, you pick the last lucky question and then we call it a day? Uh, I'm sure this, the, the participants can get in touch with the speakers and uh, post the questions later. Okay. okay, let's see what's the lucky question for... Uh, from Christine. Uh, so we have an inspiring question here. So a lot about acute hip pressures, but for uh, OA hip. So some of the audience would like to know, is there any, um, is there any um, way to manage patients with OA hip who doesn't want to go to surgery with any kind of regional anesthesia? Um, well, Tony can add, but basically this is what the pen bot was initially developed for. So we have been doing this, so yes, when someone who are not going to have a surgery or medically not fit for surgery, we can do ablation. Ablation can be in radio frequency ablation or alcohol ablation. So I have been doing a, a radio frequency ablation. I use probably three to four needles um, and on the anterior capsule to provide a strip lesion if they have mostly the weight bearing collapse. So if they have a complete collapse and a complete destruction of the hip, then I will add the optimator for the radio frequency ablation. I tend to use more alcohol now because it's much faster, much easier. And um, one of my population, subcompatible population is the ABM, the, the sickle cell and or for steroid related uh, avascular necrosis. Uh, but we, 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 we MRI them and if the uh, if they are probably less than 50% necrosis and is mainly in the weight bearing part, they are the good prognostic group. So we do alcohol phenolysis so quick, they are mostly young patient and uh, it just do the job. Uh, and, and so that are the group that I usually do alcohol. Um, okay, one thank more you. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, go ahead, Tony. Yeah, just one more comment about those uh, OA hip, apart from uh, you use uh, radio frequency or alcohol neuralizers to treat the joint, don't forget those uh, extra articular uh, component, which is uh, would be secondary to the OA hip uh, development. And then the patient, even you just treat the joint, if you miss those extra articular component, the patient will still um, complain of pain. So, so do you remember handle those problems like those uh, gluteal muscle piriformis and also the idosoas uh, muscle tendon? Thank you, uh, Tony. Thank you, Philip. Uh, also, thanks to the previous speakers, Professor Ko and uh, Chris Vermeulen. Thank you, Christine, for uh, being with us all this evening. Uh, it's been a great, uh, great session. It was surely a variety of, um, of, uh, of uh, pain and uh, region anesthesia. After all, as I say, variety is the spice of life. It has surely given us uh, a lot of food for thought, and hopefully it will change uh, practices around the world. Uh, at the end, uh, I, I envision it will improve patient care and quality. So uh, to all you participants, thank you for joining us. Uh, all the speakers, once again, thank you for sparing your time uh, and hope to see you soon and stay safe and stay healthy wherever you are. Take care and bye-bye for thank now you. until we see you again. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.